<laughs> Sorry, it I worked. lost track of time again. It did. I timed it perfectly, <laughs> even though my 54321 was uh, <laughs> all of about a second and a half. All righty. Good evening, everyone. Aether Drifter 369, good to see you this evening. Hope you're doing well. I keep on picking myself up uh, through you. Maybe like readjust your headphones on your head. Somehow it's. Danger Hobo, what's up? Yeah, initiate episode 66. <laughs> eh. Do it now. We'll watch your career with interest, young Skywalker. Yeah. Um, welcome to episode 66, not order 66, um, episode 66 of the Pathfinders podcast. Uh, we are your hosts, the Pathfinders. I am Trio 311 here with my partner in crime. My camera's really dark. Hello, everyone. I am Nazareth. Um, and... Yeah, from the Nova Forge. And uh, we are the Pathfinders, and we're charting the way through all the nebulous information surrounding the development um, of Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Um, and this evening, uh, like we do every month, we are going through the combined monthly reports for Star Citizen and Squadron 42. And I say combined, if this is your first time, uh, whether you're watching with uh, hanging out with us live on Twitch or watching it later on the YouTubes, um, what Nazareth does is he combines the two-monthly reports and removes the repeated sections because a lot of the information is shared. So that way um, we're only well, it reading used it to once. Be yeah, it's it's less so now um, with the, the big changes. Um, but then uh, creates a combined document for us to read from. And that way we are able to denote when we read something if it's uh, in one report or the other or both. Um, and that way it pro provides a little bit of context um, to the development and okay, what things why. are being worked on for I Squadron, what are Star Citizen. Chart. Oh, you messed up the pie. Oh, no. I messed up the pie chart. Let me even messed quickly up the... redo that. Ooh. But yeah, that's uh, what we have going on this evening. Um, and before we get started, as we are wont to do... Uh, Let's just uh, get caught up. Nazareth, what have you been up to, buddy? That's a great question. Um, streaming. Work. Sometimes eating. <laughs> Not sleeping, uh, apparently. Not sleeping. No, apparently, no, I don't do, I don't do that. Uh, sleeping is for people who have things to do. Um, let's see. What have we been doing? I've been working on a game called Stellar North. Um, it's gonna be a space survival kind of like raft in space. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the name. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't do Star Citizen, so um, <laughs> <laughs> it's <was> already taken. <laughs> um, and then I just got back into Space Engineers uh, this this week. Um, I'm really enjoying it. I really i I have the Space Engineers bug again, so I want to play it twenty four seven. Um, I, I hear else. you. Sometimes I just get that bug for a game that I haven't played in months or years, and you just pick it back up, you know, and you, you sort of refamiliarize yourself and scratch that itch for a couple of weeks, and then you know, return to business as usual. Yeah, except I have, I have five k hours in Space Engineers. It doesn't really go away that hard. Whoa! <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't go away. I just ignore mm -hmm. it sometimes. <laughs> so I need to figure out more stuff to do with that so I can actually like make me enjoying the game a little bit worth it. Um, but it's fun. I need, I'm going to do at least a streaming survival series um, regularly starting this week, I guess. If not, cool. also a YouTube video series version. And doing start starting up doing some shorts for it as well. Um, let's see, what else have I been doing? I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. Easty nineteen seventy five says Ghost Recon Recon Wildlands for me. Um, I have I'm been actually going through that for the first time. I haven't played it. I've been obsessed with Hell Divers for a bit. Uh, 
largely because I just loved the first one. It, it was a game that I played a whole lot of. Um, but then um, when I'm at work and I have downtime, um, if I'm not reading or writing, uh, reading for work or writing for the, my side project, I do have been playing Jagged Alliance 3 as well as continuing my campaign for Rogue Trader. So big fan of those. Um, and then if you haven't seen it, if you haven't been following the project, um, check out, um, oh geez, I just totally had a stroke and brain farted on the name. Um, Fallen Frontier? Yeah, Falling Frontier just released a new new trailer, gameplay trailer that's like 12, yeah, 13 minutes long. It doesn't come out next year. Well, it's they said this year, but I mean, who knows? I don't think it's going to come out till next year because they've been pushing it back. Um, they, I'm super hyped for the last, game. Said next year, but people don't seem to realize that there's a what you see in the Earth solar system is just a small part of the campaign. Um, like you, you go extra solar in this game, or at least that's the plan. And so we're just getting teased with little bits of it, but it's being made by one person. So it's a very ambitious, oh, wow. deep very, project. Pretty deep for one person. Yeah, right. No joke. Uh, and not not just the, the the graphics, but like the UI and everything is extremely polished. Um, yeah. It it's visually, like yeah. Um, was it? So yeah, it's, or it's, was it? You know what? I don't. I didn't find out about it until it got picked up by Hooded Horse. Until they they started helping. Ah, out. okay. So, yeah. Um, race race you to Hooded Horse um, funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Stellar um, uh, was it? Stellar North against um, Give Them Hope. Mm hmm. Um, It'd be hilarious. It's not a, not a competition, man. We're 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 the same team. We're we're both trying to. Trying to make our dreams come to come to life, um, but uh, make it one. yeah, the uh, my side project. If you haven't been catching the streams, uh, the second one was last night. Um, I'm concepting a game called Give Them Hope, um, and I'm I'm writing the prologue and doing the world building as well as uh, detailing out the game mechanics, especially how they relate to the universe and uh, and all that. So it's been a lot of fun. And I had a member of the Star Citizen community reach out to me um, and is uh, working with me to start developing um, concept art for, you know, basically everything regarding the game. Um, so it's a fun project. And that person is Mustang6. He has his own uh, Twitch. And so he'll be streaming this next Saturday at, I think it's 9, 9 a.m. Central. So 10 p.m. Eastern. Um uh, doing working on some concept art for your hero ship, which is called the um, AMS Alliance Marine Ship uh, NASA. So if you're interested, check that out. Uh, if you want to get caught up on what I'm working on, check out the streams on my YouTube. Um, uh, number two will be up tomorrow uh, around lunchtime, um, but the first one's up there right now. So uh, yeah, super super stoked about it. It's it's been a lot of fun. It's been a, a good creative outlet for me. Um, and it's something that I've just had burning a hole in my brain for years because it started out as a, a book idea. And then I was like, you know what? I could, this would make a great game if I incorporated these aspects into it. So it's been fun. And if I can't get a developer to pick it up and make it, you know, maybe I will learn something about game development and I will, uh, uh voluntold Nazareth into helping me make it. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, before we get into the, the monthly uh, reports, what's that? What was the Twitch name? Mustang 6 AD. Six AD. All, I think it's all one word, actually, here. All, are you able to find it? Can you drop the link in chat? Uh, not yet. Oh, here we go. I had it in my history. I'm going to drop the link in chat for you guys. But I also yes. created a um, uh, an event in my Discord. I posted about it on game Twitter movie. and in my yeah uh, book game movie. Yeah, that, I mean that's the 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 hat trick, right? You know the the if your if your intellectual property is a book and a movie and a game, you've you've achieved Nirvana. That's the the hat trick for uh, a creative IP. But yeah, so uh, check out Mustang 6AD uh, this next Saturday. Um, 
you know, give them a follow and, and take a look at what we're working on. We've had a, a pretty significant dialogue about what the art style for the ships is is like and and why. Uh, looking at a whole bunch of other concept art um, and and brainstorming some ideas. So it's been a lot of fun. And you can um, hear more about that in both episodes of uh, Give Them Hope on my YouTube. But, uh, episode one is out there already. Episode two will be up tomorrow. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on in chat. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Lady Space Patrol asked about uh, invariants progressing through the pipeline. We'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to it. Um, but because they say... Um, they say upcoming variants. Um, I think that their variants of an established ship would be my guess. Um, so we'll see. The, the Apollo is named and announced. So I think if they were working on it already, then they would specifically say so. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Falling Frontier looks incredible. There's definitely a lot of variants that are being worked on, but when they when they don't specifically say what it is, it lends me to believe that it's a unannounced ship. Um, in general, that's how they do things. Um, but to be fair, well, when they, they were they didn't um, yeah they for didn't the cutter. say the Rambler or they didn't say a Drake or a mm -hmm. Cutter variant when they talked about the Rambler before the Rambler was yeah. announced. So it's yeah, it's not a hard and fast rule. But a lot of yeah. the time, yeah. Yes. So we'll yes. we'll see. It's hard to are hard to know. I wish they would be a little bit more, you know, black or white about it because it would make our lives a whole lot easier. But at the same time, you know that that drives hype, and you know, even though, even if it's a little bit, because um, here we are talking about it, right? You know, and getting excited for ooh, is it the G twelve? Is it the Apollo? Is it something else? You know, we don't know. I was I was uh, I don't remember if I was in your Discord or Paul's Discord, and we were talking mm -hmm. about the. Uh, ways to make the mantis a bit more usable, and I just I just listed off like fifteen variants that I wanted. Basically, just make it do everything. Take the uh, QED and make it modular. Give it a a cargo input, a medical input, a, like just give it all the things because I love the ship. It just is useless to me. And there is a cult like following for it, and you have to like. I, I assume that CIG is aware of it. Yeah, you know, it, it, there's a cult like following it for it, except for it's a ship that the, it, its role is just really not used in the game much right now. It's very unique and, because it's the only ship currently we have in the new RSI style. Mm -hmm. The next being the Apollo. <laughs> yeah, the Apollo and Polaris and such. Yeah, it's it's not the Polaris. A, Polaris is is older one and it's military. Um, it is well, it's it's a new ship. Is also in this style. Yeah. Yes, but. Because of where concept art mm -hmm. is, it's the it, the new style for the civilian line. I would say, because the the Polaris is really more the military line, and so I see where you're getting at with like the Arastra, the Apollo, the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. Those are the sort of new aesthetic for the civilian line. You know, um, oh yes, I thought you were saying Polaris was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the no, no, no. Perseus yep. and Polaris lean more new military style, mm -hmm. and then the Orion is old industrial. Yep, old, uh, old and busted, new hotness. <laughs> yep, men in black. Anyone? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Men Sorry, men scrolling Polaris. back, catching up to the chat. Yeah, North End Trooper says the time is nice. So many indie game studios and layoffs from AAA studios everywhere. And that's this is like the the circle of you know, the circle of life. You know, the the devs get laid off and they're like, you know what? I hate these big corporate developers. I don't want to deal with them again. I'm gonna found my my own studio with you know, you know, hookers and cocaine, you know, cocaine and hookers or whatever. And you know, maybe not with maybe that. Maybe that does. Yeah, maybe that does help with the get the creative juices flowing. I don't know, but you know they they you know found a new studio with other people that get you know that they worked with, got laid off with, other people that with similar interests in the industry, and that's how these indie devs are born and they have some success. You know the ones that are successful you know grow and you know do new things, and that's how you you know it's the circle of life that they, they they grow and become bigger developers, and you know the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. But so it's a it's a we're coming into a sort of new era 
of game development where we're going to see lots of these indie developers working on passion projects. And for people like Nazareth and I, people like you guys in chat watching later on YouTube where we have a lot of these shared interests and especially a lot of games that are made by indie devs, you know, it's a, it's a good time for us, you know, the a for the following the, the development and watching people go through these processes and, you know, find their way. But B, when the games come out, it's new, fun stuff to try out. It's something new and different and interesting versus the same old reskin bullshit. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about chips when we get to that. Don't worry. We will talk about chips. Uh, all right. So. Uh, let's go ahead and switch screens and get into tonight's episode. Before we get into the monthly reports, though, we're going to talk about the big news in Star Citizen. All righty. So um, we we would be... Here, we'll call it on my screen. <laughs> don't blame me. Uh, I, I've got all I, the interwebs. No, I blame Discord. I blame Discord. I have it on 720p. I could probably dial it up for it if you want. If you pay for it, sure. Let's see. Um, stream quality. Uh, was that last week's one? 1080p. Week's one. There you go. It's still You're still only going to get 30 frames per second. I'm not giving you 60. It's just a podcast. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a document. I don't, I don't need <laughs> Um. Oh, they did so, change it. Woo, good job, CIG. Change what? Read it. Oh no! It is still April. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah, they didn't change it. Paul was They're, they you know, need to. Paul made a post about. It. Yeah, oh yeah, I agree. I, I one hundred. That is worth a retcon. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into it. Nas, do you want to read down to uh, the part before they get started in, in other news? And we'll we'll talk about uh, we'll Starting talk about off all this. With are you familiar? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Just read ex Sulin. However, you say that. Yeah, I have no idea how does how's AI yeah, think. Zizulin. <laughs> sure. Zizulin. <laughs> Are you familiar with the story of Nick Croshaw in the verse? Our lore, written by Dave Haddock and our fantastic narrative team, includes a rich history of our verse, which gives our games a great depth, immersion, and realism. One of the key milestones of human achievement within our lore is First Jump Day. When legendary human astrophysicist and pilot Nick Croshaw discovered and navigated the first jump point on the 10th of April 2271. As a community, we will now refer to the first jump day as uh, a couple days ago in March. <laughs> yeah, the. What day was it? The 9th? Yeah, I think it was March. It's the 11th? Yeah, 8th or 9th? And we will will it into existence yeah. until CIG takes note. It's because... kind of like uh, calling X Twitter. In this house, we don't call it X. We call it tw yeah, Twitter. In this Twitter. house, yeah. jump day is March. Somebody no. figured it out. It's March 9th. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in this house, we celebrate it on March 9th. Damn it. In the house of the Pathfinders. <laughs> <laughs> and became the first human to visit a planetary system beyond Seoul. Eventually, that system was named Kronosha in his honor. The journey was described as the jump that changed the course of humanity and led to the star faring future we depict in star citizen and squadron 42 you might wonder why we're telling you this story today well a little ahead of the historic date of april 10th over the weekend we had our first own we had our own first jump day celebration we opened another tech preview channel released release of server meshing technology to our Ivakai testers for this test, which focused on both server meshing and the replication layer technology, we opened our first functioning jump gate, allowing players to test traveling between two systems for the first time in our history. During the test, it is also worth highlighting, we achieved 350 concurrent players in a single shard, e.g. a replication layer connected to two servers, setting a new record. So that's uh, 3.5 times what we're currently playing on. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've had average servers. Yeah. We average about 100. You know, we've had it go up a little bit higher, but that's definitely, you know, uh, one and a half times the, the, the basically the max we've ever seen, if not more, which is pretty incredible because um, they did the 200 player 
test and the 400 player test. Uh, so it makes me wonder, like, did they only get up to 350 or did they like cap it at 350 as they're watching some sort of metric while they're going through the test? This is also two servers back in yesteryear when we had the um, letter from the chairman, they said four servers. Mm-hmm. So there's a theoretical possibility that we get up to 700 players on a shard. Yeah, that's the and actually, if you want to keep reading, we'll, we'll talk about that, too. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, it's a great achievement for our star system teams with CTG development. Cortex. What is CTG? Oh, Cortex. OK. OK, sure. Development and publishing. Oh, uh, OK. Yeah. All working together in concert. First time they used that to make the impossible possible. Of course, though. None of this would truly be possible without each and every one of you. Dang, that rings true every day. Mm-hmm. We have tracked who the first place to navigate the jump point was, which we'll share later this week. We'll obviously be hailed in some form in game, I assume. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to all of you who took the time to jump in and test, thank you. It's underlined and in bold. In other so, yeah, the. Uh, Oh, we're not yeah, doing jump point and other <laughs> stuff that's happening this week. Jump town, pff, who cares? <laughs> we had server. Honestly, had I don't know if anyone does. Yeah. Um. So, it, like, a momentous achievement for star for the star citizen community and for CIG. Um, you know, pretty dang incredible. Uh, but like Nazareth was saying, the uh, it was in the I think it was the May twenty twenty two. Um, letter from the chairman, I think, is when they had that chart. Um, actually, here, I'm going to pull it up real quick. And yes, um, Blizzard, you are directly responsible. Everyone look in the mirror and point at the person in the mirror. They are directly responsible. Okay. Uh, I believe it's this one. All right, so I'm going to find the image so that way I can share with you guys and you can all see it and know that here we are. Yep. If if you've if you've backed the game, if you've posted about the game, if you talk to a friend about the game, you're all responsible. So, this is your Here fault. is the image. Um and it's not my fault that it has a white background. Um I'm bad. But, yeah, I can't change it. This is not something I can affect with dark mode. But here is the link. This is from the May 2022 letter from the chairman. This was the plan as of May 2022. Um, yeah. So we we hadn't even got to PES yet. Although PES had been, had worked, pardon me, had worked um, at that point. The, that's when they, this is, that's when this letter came out is to announce that PES works. You know, obviously there was a lot of growing pains and teething after that, but so uh, this plan could have changed, but they haven't announced any changes regarding it. So until they announce something, this is still the plan. Um, so the um, here is what uh, just occurred with the separation of the replication layer. So splitting the DGS node from the replication layer and allowing multiple servers to split simulation is the first time we'll actually have a mesh, a server mesh. So, you know, the... Um, Having the replication layer running on another server, even if it's on the same mach- physical machine, but on another server, and those two servers, uh, whether they are, uh, you know, even if they're they're virtual servers, uh, communicating and working together, is technically a server mesh. Um, but what we think of as server meshing is multiple servers running the simulation, the game environment, and then tied to a, uh, a replication layer, which is what they tested this last weekend. But that was only one server for Stanton, one server for Pyro. Um, and so, but they also don't say very first, right here it says very first server mesh prototype in the next line, but they don't explain what that is. Um, and then here we are with the second real. You know, so that might, we might be with the, the, this might be the very first server mesh prototype. That might be what we're experiencing right now in the tech preview. Uh, but the second yeah, release, I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> the second release, yeah, the, obviously the timeline 
um, is uh, not accurate. But here we are, second release. Yeah, wasn't it server wasn't meshing? It 318's fault that basically this entire thing got delayed entire yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. The 318, they knew it was going to be rough. They didn't know it was going to be this rough. You know, and they said ahead of time it was going to be rough. Um, they they knew it was going to be. They just didn't know that there was going to be as much teething. And that was part of it. But at and the same time, like the separation of the replication layer has taken longer than they intended as well. So. Yeah. And, and to give them credit, though, they they saw what went rough for for 318 and the, the new um, entity system or tracking system. Um, it's a little replication layer. And... They said, hey, we actually can see how to not do that again with server meshing and the uh, replication layer split and crash recovery. Yeah. And so that was the that was the plan. Yeah. And and it's it's much more confident that we see 4.0 by the end of this year and it actually be live by the end of the year instead of 12 months of PTU and then it comes out in a half baked state and everything breaks. Yeah. The, the the main point was that um, PES was eight new services being introduced all at once because they couldn't in, uh, introduce them incrementally and then test them separately to work out the kinks. They had to dump it all at once. And so, you know, it, you have a, uh, a instead of an additive factor, it's multiplicative. It, it's exponential. The number of things that can go wrong and it makes it exponentially more difficult to track down what those things are and fix them. So, but with server meshing, the only the this minimum viable pro- viable product, which is static server meshing, uh, 4.0, it was the um, the the only new things were the separation of the replication layer, crash recovery, and then the meshing of servers. And those things were able to be in, uh, introduced and tested incrementally. And so that's why we had the separation of the replica- replication layer in tech preview. That's why we had the introduction of crash recovery on top of that. And now we have the introduction of server meshing with two mesh servers in the first play test on the 29th, I think it was, uh, February. Um, and then we had another iteration on that, which is what we just had this last weekend, which is the transitioning between those two servers. So they tested, are testing each thing incrementally and running these play tests to see how they work. And they're actually working really well. This is what happens when you don't have to do what they call, what CIG specifically called the big bang uh, method, which is what PES was. They just had to throw it all in there and see what happened to, to figure out what, what breaks where this, they're able to add each into each step incrementally to test it and then, you know, make sure it works. So, um, but 4.0, the server meshing minimum viable, viable product, as Jared said that Nazareth, you know, and Nazareth and I talked about this uh, a couple episodes ago, is um, they, they are aiming for summer 2024. Now, that's a pretty big range. That's like June through September. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, that's what they're aiming I for. I still think we'll miss it by a quarter. I think we're going to be fine. I, I don't Honestly, I don't see us taking that long to test it. You know, just because of, you know, hey, we're we're already testing it in tech preview. It's working well. And it's the beginning of March, you know, and we we started this at the end of the very last day of February. I mean, that's pretty incredible, you know, and to be fair. We're, we're testing server meshing. 4.0 mm-hmm. is a lot more than server mesh. Yeah, the, like, we're, we are testing and it, that's it's why it's going to take a while. It's tattoos. It's the mm-hmm. it's more hostility system. It's a bunch of new mission modules like there's a lot to test in 4.0 yeah there's a it's gonna be a big being cig it's a milestone patch which means it always gets pushed yeah i don't think it'll be where june is not gonna happen if if anyone is thinking early june just because of and that's why i wanted to cover this because like it's a good thing to temper expectations you know i don't think we're gonna get pushed into fall um but I do think that we're not going to see it early summer because, like you said, they're the they ha- it's going to have to it's go through its normal QA process. Part of the crew. Oh, we got to follow. Ship. No deal. Part of the crew. Part of the ship. Part of the crew. Part, Steady, of, the part of the ship. Part of the crew. Part of the ship. <laughs> tattoos. That's the most crucial part of it. See. Yeah, definitely tattoos. Tattoos and beards. 
bring I'm it on. Sorry, I want my little toy containers. Yeah, but the 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 I think that the normal QA and testing process for the features is going to continue as planned alongside the testing for server meshing. And that's why I think that they're starting this now in order to get a head start on it before they start integrating the new features into the build. Um, because normally, like for a build, it's, it's pretty average for, you know, it to, you know, uh, go through a month, up to two months of QA. And so I think that, you know, a, a, a four plus, you know, four to five month, you know, um, QA, you know, QA timeline for 4.0 isn't out of the or you know, isn't going to be out of the ordinary. But, um, you know, because oh, Mikey crew. Moto with the follow. Part Thank you so ship. much for the follow. The support. <laughs> part of the ship. Part of the crew. Part of the ship. Part of the crew. Part of the ship. Now, what do you think of the new ship? What do you think they're going to, what, what do you think going to come out between 3.22 and 4.0? 3.23 and 4.0? Yes. What did I say? A dot one. You said three twenty two. Yeah, I think we're gonna have a dot it's one. It's gonna be and, like a major dot one. Yeah, I think. Well, I think I don't think it's gonna be a major dot one. It's just in, in dot one for Invictus launch week, and then maybe a dot two. Um, yeah, for Alien Week and whatever else. Um, but I don't think we're gonna see a three twenty four. There's no reason. Doing a three twenty four would take resources away from four point oh. Yes. Even even if 324 is the same tech branch as 323, which would make it a dot one, um, you know, they the I don't think they're going to add any new features of any significance um, to the 320 you know, to uh, to a dot one or dot two of 323 um, because they are taking away QA resources and testing resources. Um, from 4.0 i don't think cig is gonna uh once they get 323 out the door they're not gonna uh, and you know they're not gonna have anything be a distraction from 4.0 and i, I think they do a 0.5 with everything that is ready to do a thing so any ships that got done in the last three months because we're getting we're supposedly getting 323 mm -hmm. around march april end of march start of april um and so we have that gap space between 323 releasing and the next patch date, which would be September, uh, late summer. I don't, I really don't see um, a, a Q2 for 40. And I know, I know because of how they're talking internally, I, that's exactly what they're aiming for. <laughs> yeah, that's what the, they are. They want 4.0 to be June. It's not. They gonna really do. <laughs> and they're they're aiming they're they're aiming for it to be their Q two, which is end of June. Really, always slips into July patch, and it's going to slip into sometimes August. August yeah, you know, if not. September. You think they're just going to delay it till till it till it's done? I think we're we're definitely going to get the dot one for Invictus launch week because we always do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they're not going to distract from the testing and the emphasis on getting. 4.0 ready because like you said it does it is going to have some big features but at the same time those features are squadron features largely the, for the mm -hmm. most part so they already have had a lot of qa testing we're really just testing them in a, a networked environment but they're going to and i'm going to read the message uh, of the day um, from 229 when they did the first server meshing play test uh, today's Evo Cadi tech preview playtest will be the first in a long series of meshing playtests, starting with static server meshing. And so it's interesting they said starting with static Ooh. server meshing. So that that's the other thing. Very is, fun worded, right? And so that makes me think that you know, you know, we're by the, you know what we're, we're going to be rolling into testing dynamic server meshing, like. Basically, like right after 4.0 drops, or, or you know, around if that. If not time before, frame. yeah, yeah, because you like know, give, you know, it, plus or minus. For for those who haven't heard, which I assume most of you have, the network devs working on server meshing do not want to do static. They just don't want to do it because it's a terrible plan. The problem is moving from current and traditional server tech to a dynamic server mesh is 
kind of like driving in the U.S. compared to driving in France. It you just don't do one to the other. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so many different things. So they're taking a half step to server meshing, but not dynamic server meshing. Yep. So and the really the only reason they're doing this is because they need the data from static server meshing in order to this part the typo the future plans are separating the replication layer into a horizontal scalable service this is something i talked about with benoit at CitizenCon, as well as working on a dynamic dgs mesh that allows dgs nodes to dynamically scale up down and split simulation into dynamic areas so the this is uh, we we're talking about right now we're talking about one replication layer for two servers and the plan for the server meshing for uh, minimum viable product 4.0 is one replication layer for four servers two for pyro two for stanton because that allows you to test all the transitions the transitions going from one area of stanton into another that is managed uh, um, managed by two different servers as well as transitioning from a server in Stanton to another server in Pyro via the jump point. And so it allows you to test all those transitions and they need that data, not only regarding the transition between servers, but also um, how the uh, replication layer handles the transfer transfer of entity authority in all those different ways. But they also need the data for um, the replication layer to see at what point does the replication layer start to exhibit strain by having too many connections. And so like we just talked about how they uh, had 350 people in a shard with two servers. We are going to need to see where the player count can get with four servers. And at that point, uh, how much strain is there on the replication layer? Because not only do <laughs> the servers need to dynamically um, spin up and down based off the, the number of uh, players and entity counts, but also eventually the replication layer, there is going to be an upper limit for how many connections it can handle. And so they'll have to spin up another replicant to handle um, a, a group of servers in a shard. So you, for dynamic server meshing, you could imagine that um, maybe you get up to the point where Stanton has 12 servers and you know maybe the player count in Pyro is low enough that Pyro has eight um, but it's too much for the replication layer and they'll be able to spin up another replication layer, another replicant in order to then uh, make it. So that way one is handling Stanton, one is handling Pyro, but they're still in the same shard. That's what dynamic server meshing is. And that's why they need that data to move on to that point. But they're already gathering that data. That that, that But just by starting this, first server meshing prototype, they have started to gather that data. And so they can continue as they're testing uh, to get ready for 4.0 and the server meshing minimum viable product, they're gathering the data they need to uh, continue the development of the services that manage this stuff. There's four additional services that tell uh, that that manage the shards that tell the the replication layers, you know, what they're going to have authority over and you know how to split up and stuff like that. Um, so that development is is going to continue. They've already started that development, but they can't continue it and and finish it for the the launch of uh, dynamic server meshing without this data. But they don't have to wait until 4.0 goes live to get that data. They're, they're getting it now, and that's what's exciting. Um. So yeah, uh, which came first, the server or the replicator? <laughs> <laughs> uh, replicators are, are uh, rep, they, well, it, there's that's two different sci fi IPs replicators and replicants. <laughs> what happens when a replicator and a replicant meet? Who, who, you know, who wins? <laughs> oh boy. I didn't necessarily uh, mean just me the wrong side of the road driving. I'm just talking about like the basic ideas <laughs> of driving. Mm hmm. Oh gosh, have you ever um, seen does, those it, videos? All I was trying to pick was a country that didn't drive with North American rules, like a rule set. Most North American, well, I guess U.S. and Canada, run with around the same rule set and mm -hmm. similar signage. Canada's a bit have different, you, but... Uh, have I you ever seen those videos tree. Uh, of like, uh, the, uh, the giant on. roundabouts in certain like Magic Southeast roundabouts? Asian? Yeah, the, well, the, the ones in like Southeast Asian and... and uh, uh, 
uh, even Middle Eastern countries where it's like has like eight or nine different streets feeding into it. And they're all just, you know, it's this giant mass. Yeah, magic roundabouts. They're called magic roundabouts. Yeah. Magic or it's, metric? It's a roundabout with several roundabouts around it with roads feeding into it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just magic nuts. Roundabouts. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, somehow, they're markedly more safe than an intersection. Yep. It's wild. I blame it on Americans you know, and Westerners. I do too. General. I'm so glad my town's getting a roundabout. Watch everyone yeah. just crash into trees. Oh, man. The, the, the roundabouts <laughs> here in Idaho... Um, the number of accidents I, I ran on when I worked 911 here where people just went full send over the, <laughs> oh the my center God. part, you know, because they weren't paying attention. Yeah. Just locked up and just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, very much um, uh, Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> like, um, like there's also so yeah. a like a rural uh, safety thing that Tom Scott actually came across. Um, and instead of like on a rural road, having an intersection in the middle of nowhere where literally no one stops at the stop sign, offset mm -hmm. the roads just enough solves every safety issue. It's amazing. Like there are these simple things you can do to make roads way yeah. safer. For this is where we can't have nice things. Yep. yep. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Um, Takes a Nazos, was there anything else that circles, we yeah. should cover? Regarding server meshing and the and the news, I think we hit the big points. Server meshing the news, yeah, we definitely hit the big points. Um, this is, as they've said in 2017, this is the last major tech. We will be on the 4.0 branch until 1.0, and also they started talking about 1.0 recently. Yeah, Chad McKinney. <laughs> yeah, jump the gun entirely. I'm sure we'll be getting a, a letter for the chairman about server meshing being a thing and oh, yeah. how we're now going to be marching towards the 1.0 what 1.0 means i think literally everyone has their own opinion even in cig everyone has their own opinion chris hates bed logging but loves 1.0 <laughs> okay uh yeah red bed logging is also going to get a complete overhaul but that's a that's a story for a different time uh um, yeah it'll but be yeah we'll be on 4.0 till but... till 1.0 and mm. i imagine I imagine internally there is at least somebody who wants dynamic by the end of the year. Yeah, I think and that's the, the internal goal. I just don't know if that's how feasible. realistic that is. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it, it, it even I mean, if they're if they start the work on those services, you know, the, that's the hard part is how much dev resources do they have available to continue to iterate on static meshing and get these things dialed in and right while also having people working on um, those additional services that are that they need to continue the development on with this data for dynamic server meshing and that's the that's the hard part is we, you know we don't know um, and so it'll just it's really going to depend on how well it goes <laughs> yeah Okay, this is okay. I'm gonna throw something out that may be a bit weird, but no, they wouldn't. Yeah, half the things coming in the next two patches are because of a squadron. More than half, I, I would say 70, 80, greater than 80 percent, greater than 70, 80 percent. I was talking sure. the next two patches, yeah. Well, this patch, yeah, server meshing three and three is and a star season first tech, and yeah. pyro and pyro stuff is tattoo and stuff that's probably. I don't know. Tattoo was probably squadron. A lot of the tech is is, is squadron based, um, and and so we would not be getting this rush of, uh, we would not be getting half the stuff we are getting from squadron at the rate we are gonna get it because how they have been developing thus far Star Citizen is a much milder pace, and so when they went away to work on squadron. They really got to crank down and actually do a whole bunch of development all at once mm -hmm. instead of without having to develop thing, it for a live environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tweak a thing, throw it out, and then we get like the bunkers, the trolleys, the uh, vehicle munching, all these like stupid features that have no reason to be there or were abandoned the second they were launched into the game. 
with bunkers. Yep. They were supposed bunkers were supposed to be the UGFs we have now. They just was a completely different time. And they said, do this. Oh, wait, get it done before Squadron or not Squadron. Get it done before Citizen Con. Our priorities have shifted away. Part of the crew. And so they part just the stagnated. Part of the crew. Part of the Another ship. one. <laughs> part oh, of the Valley crew. South. Part of the Valley crew. Valley South. Thank you so much for the follow. Thanks for the support. Yeah. Um, nope. And Walker 300, there's been no indication of Nick's receiving any work in ages. And the work that they did talk about um, is minor. Yeah. It, they, they, but it will they, take they them... Yeah, I don't think it will take them more than a quarter to to finish it. So um, when we when they start pirate our next, I think it will be. Oh, by the way, Nix is in the next update. Ping, there it is. Yeah. So, Lady Space Patrol, the the AI performance will. It, I I am expecting it to start to improve a little bit with static, um, be, uh, server meshing because I I do expect that they're not going to jam it chuck full. Uh, and they want to be able to see where the performance is at sort of like a normal baseline, um, a different MacGuffin, a different uh, excuse or whatever. Um, but the with dynamic server meshing is where they can set however, you know, where they want the servers to be and say, OK, if the server gets below, you know, 20 FPS or something like that or, or, or 15, you know, it, get, it starts to get down to 20. We're going to spin up another server. Um, so that way, before it gets to 15, it can it can split the load. Um, so if you've ever been on a server that's running at 30 FPS, that's going to be your baseline, you know, your baseline experience. Now, the other thing when it comes to AI is the AI that we have in Star Citizen right now. Um, it, it, it a lot of it is getting replaced incrementally with the new behaviors and the new systems that were developed for Squadron, and those new systems are designed from the ground up to not only, you know, have more functionality, but they're also designed to be more performant and be less um, dependent and less impacted by server performance. Um, so it's a, a, a two part thing. Um, so yeah, the, it's, uh, people are, I, I think it's a um, misconception and probably one another one of those things where you have to throw cold water on the expectations of oh static server meshing is coming with 4.0 the AI are going to magically perform better mm, we're not going to get 30 FPS on every server all of a sudden overnight because we went to um, uh, four servers between Pyro and Stanton because really we're, we're just four times as many NPCs doing crap <laughs> Yeah, they they are going to add more stuff. The server, po the NPC populations are going to go up. The player populations are going to go up, and so like if you have two hundred players in Stanton, um, you have that many more people dispersed. But at the same time, Stanton isn't getting any bigger, um, and so you are going to. It is going to give the Stanton system, you know, the Pyro system, more overhead because you're going to be able to split up some uh, of the the strain, but. Um, you know, if you have max dispersion of players in Stanton right now and the server box down to three to five FPS, um, if you do that with 100 players, you know, there you have basically the whole server is being simulated. You know, you, all the, all the areas are being simulated. All the NPCs that can be run are being run. Now with 4.0, all of a sudden you've got 200 players in Stanton. Well, you know, the, all of Stanton's already being simulated. And so, but now the workload is split between two servers. So what they're going to do is they'll probably have more NPCs, but, you know, so, you know, the, if I'm setting my expectations where if you have max server capacity and it gets down to three to five FPS, I think with, um, 4.0 max server capacity on a server that has been running for a little bit, it's going to get down to six to 10 FPS. And so we're, it's going to be an improvement, but it's not going to be like a um, I'm not expecting some sort of just massive improvement until we have dynamic server meshing where that same server can get split even more to prevent you from getting you know into single digits to keep you in double digits or even to keep you above 20. Maybe they'll set that limit at 20 and they want to keep it above 20 FPS, you know, closer to 30. Don't know. Yeah, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see and see what they say. Yeah, the the yeah. the awakened AI quanta, but the quanta is something entirely different. 
quanta aren't run on the server. They they don't nope. exist on the server. Um, the those quanta uh, when it will be we don't even have quanta in the game right now. But when quantum is hooked up, quanta will only impact the um, oh what should we call it the, uh, the the zones uh, the probability um, volumes the probability volumes, and so. Quanta in an area of a probability volume will just change the probability that you will run into a quanta of that type. Yeah, instead of like the replication layer being attached to the DGS and sending like basically everything that happens on one is simulated back and forth. Quantum is a system separate server entirely that basically just text the DGS what's happening. Mm -hmm. They yep. they don't have a meaningful connection. They're just the simulation is over there and it's just texting the replication layer saying replicate this effect everywhere. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we get back into the monthly reports, cause we need to need to get going on those, uh, that uh, is a, a, uh, the, the next spectrum pulse um, next week will be on uh, where in the world is the quantum simulation part two. Cause we did that like what uh, a year and a half, two years ago. Um, where we did where in the world is the quantum simulation in Tony Z. We're going to, we're going to update that. Um, after watching Ray's guides videos, I want to clear up some misconceptions and go back and take a look at some of um, quantum and how that relates to what was said by Benoit about why quantum was paused. That's going to be what it's about is uh, why was work on the quantum simulation paused. Into sort of, uh, there'll be a little bit of uh, theory crafting, but it's theory crafting supported by evidence uh, about what we know about quantum. And I think there's so some misconceptions. So we, so we all. I think that Ray has some misconceptions about how quantum works and what it does. Um, and so I want to I want to try and clear that up and, and um, clear the air around what Benoit said about the the pausing of development on that. Um, so we'll, I'll be working on that this week before next week's episode, and we'll talk about that later. But um, yeah, let's get back into the monthly reports. So uh, here, I'm going to switch screens while I pull up the right thing. Let's see. So we'll close that, and we'll close that. All righty. And okay. Um, and we are... Starting with AI content on the squadron side. Okay. Now I'm ready. Are you sure? I am sure. And Nazos, if you want to start us off with the um, the PU um, introduction part. What do we want to call that? I forget. Headers. Uh, header. There you go. Thank you. Before you do, <laughs> look at this image. Is, this is that base cool? building or is that an outpost? I've, I've been racking my brain. I think these are like outlying things attached to UGFs. Or sorry, the, the makes new, sense. The makes sense. New UGFs, um, you know, distribution centers. Well, yeah, UGFs. UGFs are dead. Long live uh, UGFs. Um, I think these are All like hell, you, you know the uh, distribution centers. So. Yeah, I think these are going to be associated with distribution centers just due to the size, but they could be related to outposts as well. Um, um, because we know back that when they were doing. Back when they were building the tile set for uh, yeah, colonialism exactly. outposts, those were in them. Mm -hmm. yep, they said, they did this have is these. the tile set players will use. So, mm -hmm. even though it might that not be base seems building. to not be the case now, yeah, we'll have they to might see be... when they actually talk about their base building design. Maybe they're working on new outposts for Stanton. I you know, would we, love. Had... I would absolutely love them to tell us what the next tile set's going to be. Yeah, and update the Stanton outposts and, and figure out what's good because they are dated. So, yeah, I I, I want to see I want to see two new designs, which is a high tech one. So we have colonialism, high tech, and then industrial. So one is much more smooth lines and newer materials. Definitely not going to be built off the land. So it's like mm -hmm. shipping in high tech materials or high end materials. And then the industrial one being basically everything is concrete and steel, just base concrete and steel, everything metal mm -hmm. girders, sharp angles, you know, and that that Argo kind of uh, that uh, Argo industrial um, refinery cargo deck kind of feel. 
So I want those two designs. Yeah. Gib. Anyway. Yes. Headers. Uh, PU Monthly Report, February 2024. It's been a busy start to the new year across CIG Studios. February was no different. Read on for everything done on for the Persistent Universe throughout February, including vehicle progress, cloud rendering development, and AI updates. Oh, boy. All right. And Squadron 42 header. And then I'll let you continue into AI content. And I'm going to go and grab my ice cream real quick. I'll be right back. Ooh, I need to have some ice cream. Actually, Welcome to I'm going to have a beer. You can have both at the same time. Ew. <laughs> Bailey's works with ice cream. It's, it's fine. All right. Welcome to February Squadron 42 monthly de development report. In close, you'll find details on the latest progress made across the campaign, including combat encounters, vehicle collisions, and environmental storytelling. Thank you for your continued support for Squadron 42. Sincerely, CIG Communications. Root beer float minus the root. <laughs> AI content, Squadron 42. AI content continued to make key enhancements and refinements with the Idris yeah, Idris Stanton receiving focus in February. Stanton, the name of the Idris that you play on in the campaign. For example, dynamic conversations were fine-tuned with updates to NPCs' standing, standing positions and additional randomizations to provide more authentic feel. Updates were also made to the gym, including punching ba or punch bags, just a single punch bag, one punch bag that, that allows it's quite the align. workout <laughs> <laughs> that now aligns perfectly and animates smoothly. They also reworked gym hours to be more balanced. So players will see correct the correct number of NPCs whenever they choose to visit plans to plans for route. Busy. There we go. Busier times were created too to ensure NPCs can always find place a place to work out. So basically, instead of going there, you know, at one in the morning and it being full, they're like, the hey, crew. maybe they actually want to sleep and they'll actually have less crew, population part during part the of the hours. crew, part of the crew, and part of the crew, part of the crew, part of the crew, Another following. Thank you, Sylvester, for following the channel. Yeah, uh, doing like actual sub some subsumption things. Additional animations were also added to the bridge, including hands on ears to demonstrate cross ship communications and add variety throughout the ship. Uh, NPCs will now carry more diverse range of items, too. Trolley pushing and cargo handling animations were refined for, uh, for added realism, while the security officer outside the bridge salutes players as they walk by. And then for AI features, which is up next, we have a paragraph in SC and then three in SQ. All right, I'll start on the SC side. Oh, is it all shared, though? Oh, wait, no, AI features. There we go. My bad. I was looking at tech. Yeah, yeah, the first one. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, there's um, no AI content in Star Citizen. Tonight's stream is not sponsored by Starburst IPA from Ecliptic Brewing, but if you are from Ecliptic Brewing, it could be. <laughs> Sponsor us. Help, it, help, help Nazareth and I live a more comfortable life and do more nerd stuff uh, and less day job stuff. <laughs> um, okay. So um, as mentioned, AI features starting on the star citizen side, as mentioned in last month's report, AI features continue to develop features for a key initiative. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Speculation. You got anything Nas? What do you think? What do you think that key initiative is? The first iteration I, of I which is planned for 323. I think civilians, like a basically overhaul of civilians. Yeah, all the NPCs walking around landing zones and, and stations not being so just blindly following a, a path. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see it. They, they talked about, they've talked about a lot of stuff for like conversations and things and a couple other features that they they want to add and that they will be adding at least sometime in the near future, um, mm -hmm. specifically around events. So Invictus and IAE will actually have specific IAE goers. Um, the tourist so behavior. Think, Remember that yeah, one? Yeah, the tourist behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tourist behavior, uh, the hawker behavior. Later. Mm -hmm. There are multiple uh, new behaviors that would fit into that for sure. 
and they say 323, but it's Invictus Launch Week is going to be in the 323 branch. It'll just be a dot one. So yeah, yeah. I think that's I a think solid like, prediction. And they also the narr- narrative has been working on a voice pack for NPC chatter. So I think this yeah the big Walla, key right? initiative, huh? Walla. Walla. Isn't that what it's called? Isn't that what it's called? Walla. The, the oh, background I don't chatter. What their I don't remember what their background tech is called that they called something that is something else again. Um, I'm more Jules and Um, but I think the key initiative is is basically getting civilians up to the bar that even the the security NPCs are in the game right now. Mm-hmm. Like currently, civilians are just cardboard cutouts. They they do nothing. Even the even the people at the counters barely do anything. Yeah, they literally just walk around aimlessly. Um, no, I think that's a solid prediction. And they did if they. If we do have a, a bit of a performance overhead with the separation of the replication layer, I think that would be a, a good way to test it out and see, A, how resilient are these behaviors and NPCs to degraded server performance, but B, um, you know, how can they you know, do a good job of taking advantage of that to make the universe feel more lived in and alive, to make people feel like they're, they're in a, a, a city, a, a space station, spaceport, what have you. I think, as you mentioned earlier, the new new AI systems they're bringing in also have more performance, so they might not need a ton of overhead to implement them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a um, especially on two fronts replacing, kind of thing. Yeah, especially if they're replacing um, the if they have not their current uh, path detection and they're replacing it with a new path detection that they're currently implementing. That is more efficient. They've talked a lot about how that is way more efficient because it just works. It doesn't get hung up. It's also dynamic. It doesn't look as far. You don't have to um, bake. If you guys know what that means. Basically, take any area and do a process to it that takes way more computing power than you can do while playing the game. So bake an area to have navigation mesh on it. It's all dynamic, and it doesn't require a whole ton of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, a more efficient yeah, that, system. That's my vote. I, I, yeah, I would not vote. I would not bet against that at all. I think that's a solid prediction, and I, and I, I think that's something that we really need, especially leading up to 4.0. Because you remember how many new players came in with 3.18 and PES, and you know they they don't want to have that level of disappointment, and so they yeah. want you know the the they we're gonna have a, a lot of new players coming in over the next year with 4.0 going towards the static server or dynamic server meshing and then the lead up to squadron. Um, and so they want the universe to be in a better state. That's why they're introducing all these new features, um, but also why they're all you know, uh, revamping all this tech. So that way, you know, the, the CIG is literally trying to put their best foot forward for the, the, the next generation of star citizens. Um, so yeah. Also uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's AI features for the star citizen side on the squadron side. Um, last month, the AI features team progressed with two key fights, uh, kept on wanting to say flights when I was reading that in my head, uh, and continued to improve combat animation animations for FPS encounters. Hit reactions were also enabled for NPCs. Um, let's see. The team also expanded the movement system to allow NPCs to use, pardon me. Um, to use ad hoc animations to enter cover locations without passing through dynamically created paths. Pardon me, hiccup. Uh, They also continued to support the other Squadron 42 teams by investigating and fixing various bugs, AI features. And next we have AI tech, which starts off, um, look like a, a shared sentence. Yeah, it it's both? weird. Okay, so how this is actually written is the first sentence is shared, then the squadron side breaks off, and there's only a star citizen side. So if you want to switch over to star citizen, it's more than half star citizen. Okay. Um, AI. And tech. then we catch back up with squadron for like the bulk of the middle of it. Then there's another star citizen bit. It's okay. super weird. I actually did take the time and actually like 
not read it word for word, but really dig into it. So hopefully there shouldn't be any duplicated sentences in this one. Like it was last month. AI tech shared. During February, AI tech focused on a variety of improvements. No period. It's weird because it continues alongside feature work. But on the squadron side, it continues with four NPCs using trolleys. It's weird. Huh. It's so weird. Okay. That is bizarre. Uh, it's, it's, it's parallel universe weird. All right. Including for the navigation system. The main focus of this was on extending the planetary nav navigation mesh to be able to generate across the whole planet. Due to a limitation of the initial imp implementation, it currently has a latitude limit at which navigation tiles can be created. Which, with this new approach, nav mesh can be gener generated anywhere on the planet following physics terrain patches. The devs are currently improving the tile border simplification step to make sure all nav mesh tiles correctly uh, connect correctly with each other. So previously to this update, they were having problems with it um, making navigation mesh towards the poles of the planet. Um, and so they, they've solved it. They now have this new uh, generation system that just they just don't have to worry about where anything is anymore. It just does its job. It just works. It just works. I wonder if they are doing this in advance of adding new locations near the poles. Because honestly... I feel not like specifically because they already the map, have one that's not working. Do they? Okay. Yeah, I'm they, they to had think mentioned of locations. last month, like, hey, we already have, they, they said that they're already having a problem with one of the outposts they put in. in oh, this okay. Match. Gotcha. Oh, yeah, the, the new, um, one of the new um, derelict Dalek outposts. Settlements. Yeah, that's what it was, the derelict settlements. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Now I yeah. remember. So, and basically, just this just unlocks creativity. This means that they don't have to worry about anything moving forward. I wouldn't be shocked if we had a pull located uh, distribution center, and that was why this needed yeah. to get done. Well, and, you know, even if it's not just locations, you know, if you land near the pole in your ship, when we eventually have NPC crew, your crew are going to need mm -hmm. to get out and walk around on the, on the, the surface and such. Um, or if you're down there and then, you know, NPCs come in and attack you or, or, or whatever, they respond to a rescue, um, any sort of gameplay, it doesn't have to be at a, lo uh, a, a, a pre-built location is going to need this technology to function if you're near the poles and you don't have to be like sitting right on the pole. It's, there's a pretty substantial region around the pole where these that that grid system for the um the tile the tile system for the the terrain um uh, very gets very narrow and that's what part of the issue was you know as it yeah. starts out wide here near the equator and then because of the way the planetary tile system works it gets really narrow well that was interfering with the navigation mesh and so now we won't have that problem. Um, so if you crash land, you know, at the frozen, extra frozen North Pole of you know, <laughs> of Microtech, then, you know, someone can come rescue and an NPC won't be like stuck on the ramp of their C8R or their, their Cutlass Red uh, and like, well, I can't walk there. The floor is lava. And he's like, what? No, I'm right here. Help me. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. Man, I would love NPC medical medics. That would be so cool. Oh, I, I cannot wait. It, it's... That is part of the plan. I can't wait for yeah. it. You know, but yeah. I can trust an NPC. <laughs> NPC uh, medics and rescue technicians um, you know, do not resist. You are being rescued. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really cool. Because like, once we have NPC medics that can come rescue, it's not that far off to have one on our ship. So. Yeah. Well, it's Moving it's not just having it on your ship, but you can essentially just put out a beacon for rescue, and you know you can select Kidnap the. Them. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but you know you you the, the the goal is for you to be able to have an NPC come and rescue you. Uh, uh, you know you can say okay, well, uh, uh, it has to be a player at this level of reputation. You know, come rescue you, and if they no one responds, then an NPC from that organization, that re you know a rescue organization will come and they'll rescue you. And they have meant for it to always be like they want for bounty hunting where, okay, you get rescued and now you just essentially press the button and you backspace and you don't re you, you don't die, 
but you just wake up at the hospital that they're going to transport you to. Um, and you know, you, you have been healed and you get charged a bill and you have, you know, some debuffs from the procedure and such, you know, and that's how you, there's no more backspace. It's a, you are getting rescued, but they fake the transport, um, aspect of the rescue. Uh, or maybe you, you just backspace and you black out, but then you wake up and you got rescued while you're unconscious. Um, that's been the whole idea for being downed. And if you can't get rescued by a player, you get rescued by an NPC. That's been the idea since the beginning. Have we done an episode on Death with Spaceman specifically? Uh, on medical stuff uh, more, but we haven't really talked about as much about Death of a Spaceman. And people think that because regeneration came in that Death of a Spaceman is dead. It's not dead. We- it that it just the the it, it evolved a little bit. But Death of a Spaceman is still a thing. Rescue is still a thing. You're not yeah. going to backspace to regeneration. You know, regenerate all the time you're going to backspace to get rescued. Regeneration is only for catastrophic death. I wonder if we should do a, a Spectrum Pulse on Death of Spaceman, what it was and what it is. Yeah. I, I, I want to do that said. once we get more information on the next implementation for medical. Because we're yeah. at medical tier Makes zero. Sense. And yep. I'm hoping that they will do a... Remember when they did the ISC on engineering? Um, mm-hmm. what do they call that? Um, uh, they have a name for it. I said it earlier too. Uh, design brief. Yeah. Design brief. They did a design brief engineering. I did it. They need to do a design brief medical because we, it, that when it, medical was released, they literally said tier zero. What we have is tier zero. We aren't even close to, we're, we're not even at tier one. And so we're going to need medical tier one in a hurry. I am expecting because they talked about the Apollo uh, going into development. I'm expecting it to go into development this year. Like when we see the um, isn't it in development now? Didn't it kick off before the end of the year? It did, but I, we haven't heard about it in the monthly reports. Yes. Yeah. So, um, long live the uh, uh, Rip Apollo. Long live the Apollo. Um, so we'll see. But I'm expecting that they won't release the Apollo without tier one of medical gameplay and actor status tier two. Anyway, sorry. Watch, tangent. We're going to get, we're gonna get the, the, the final update, not the final update, the, the, the first update post scheduling CIG's catastrophic. What's the cataclysmic rescheduling of the year? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to be like, ah, oh, we're actually, because medical's not going to be in, we've, we've decided not to pull, uh, Apollo. Just like riots, absolute riots. Yep. I'll fling poo. Uh, <laughs> For NPCs using trolleys, focus was on the exact positioning of trolleys in the environment. Now an NPC can correctly push a trolley to a location with an arbitrary orientation. The team has also improved transit and elevator uses while pushing trolleys so that the overall flow is more robust and fluid. Fluid trolleys confirmed. Uh, that's cool. Just basically like NPCs use trolleys good now. Uh, spaceships, spaceship behaviors were also iterated on to deliver better ship versus turret combat. Fighters will now correctly target standalone turrets and perform appropriate combat behaviors. Numerous updates were added to the Apollo tool, not the Apollo ship, such as the improved feedback for errors in missions. For example, the overall box that represents a function turns red when the logic contains errors. This is a dev facing, uh, addition or update. Uh, The team also increased the usability of navigation between mission callbacks, allowing the designers to jump to appropriate logic from multiple elements of the interface. A new UI for the subsumption tool is underway too. Uh, So the Apollo tool is the way they set up missions. Basically, it's, it's, uh, it's it's the mission setup suite. And subsumption is the AI behavior setup suite. All right. And then one more sentence on Star Citizen. AI Tech, conti- specifically Star Citizen, AI Tech continued to support P releases while an important upcoming feature continued development. Which can be experienced in Alpha 3.3. 3. 
God, which they is are being a lot like what we talked about just a minute ago with a key initiative in 2023. Like, what the? What are they planning? A key initiative and a um, upcoming feature related to AI. And and coming uh, in 323. I am like it's it. I don't know why. Like I. So we are going to get caught up on the roadmap next week uh, before we do the spectrum pulse. But I'm I'm pulling up the release view right now just to give uh, credence to how vague they're being and how big 323 is going to be. Because here we are. Every time every time I see the release view now, I'm like. There's like 80 things that aren't there. If you've seen the last three patches of patch watch, there's like five of them Mm -hmm. per patch. It's insane. So like the crap they throw on the release view is nothing compared. It's wild. Uh, Lady Space Patrol says in Daisy, for example, you can get different illnesses and need to take antibiotics several times over a day. I fully expect a similar level of medical gameplay for star citizen. When we, when I covered, um, I did as a scanner anomaly, I covered what CIG, you know, sort of big picture view has in store for medical gameplay. And from the very beginning, it's designed to be one of the most impactful, um, careers and and in-depth careers in star citizen. Um, and that has always been that way, but people always expect surgeon simulator. And it's like, no, you don't have to do surgeon simulator. You just have to have a good actor status system, you know, and expand upon what we have right now, but with like animations and some more realism, just like they're doing for everything else. Yeah. They, and they have the confirmed, um, not anytime recently, but way back when that the disease that hit uh, world of Warcraft is actually a planned feature in star citizen. <laughs> plagues yeah, they, are a planned feature um yeah. drugs dynamic having, events like all the regarding all that yeah yep all the drugs we have in game are planned features to actually have effects on you um i hope they do addiction um uh debuffs because if you're gonna give effects of drugs give the proper debuffs if they're gonna have us have hygiene have us have the proper addictions like that'd be Oh, I know we're getting a little too close to RPG territory, but they want these effects, but they need to matter. So mm-hmm. you need to have debuffs for for addictions, and you can't just take Widow all day and not look like Wallace Cl- Clem. So. Yeah. <laughs> so there is nothing in on the release view right now. Like obviously, the release view for three twenty three is already thick. Holy <laughs> mother of God, it's thick, <laughs> and there is nothing. Is yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, tr- triple C. We're gonna go with triple C thick. Scroll through it. You know, watch me scroll through it right now. Do it on your own time. There is n- n- like maybe they're talking about reputation. That I, I don't think it's. I think I don't think it's reputation hostility. It might be, but there's not really anything that is AI tech AI content related on there right now. And so these things that they're talking about that Nazareth was just reading about, these are things that haven't been added to the release view just yet. Um, and for a patch that isn't due to release for at least another probably five, six weeks. Um, so I do think we're going to see more. We just had two more things added for the, to the release view on this la- uh, latest roadmap update last Wednesday. I think we're probably going to see more. Um, so we'll see. And Which is they, backwards. They're supposed to be removing stuff. Come on. Yeah. We know well, how and the goes. other the other thing that it could be is it could also end up being things that end up in the patch watch. And so if you don't pay attention to those patch watch posts, um, generally Nazareth and I will cover them when a patch uh, just before a patch goes live. So you know, stay tuned for that. But keep an eye out on the patch watch posts because a lot of those things, you know, to me, in my opinion, do really do deserve a release view card, but they don't always get it. Um, and so they they very much often fly under the radar um, across the community. And I see people talk about it all the time. Wait, what? That was introduced or, you know, that happened? And it's like, oh, yeah, it was in the patch watch. But the patch watch, you know, like there is very little coverage of the patch watch features and content. So um, that was it for AI tech, right? Nope. Nope. We got two more sentences. On oh, the on Squadron site. Here we go. 
Go for last it. Last two sentences. Specifically for Squadron 42, AI tech focused on support and bug fixes across the project. For example, they fixed a calculation and that they fixed the calculation that animates or animations use when NPCs enter cover to ensure they are facing their target. They also fixed an issue with ship operator seats caused by the AI thinking that that only a specific animation was available when exiting. That had to be annoying. So every time they every time they exit a seat, they picked specifically that animation every time, not any of the variants. The only animation that's available to me is tuck and roll. And so I'm gonna get out of the seat and tuck and roll out of it. Whoosh. Yeah. I'm gonna do a um, somersault. And then, <laughs> and then one of the meteor ones, ship art, all squad all now squadron, not none squadron, all star citizen, ship art. No oh. ship work for squadron. Interesting. Yeah, because then it goes it back going, to yeah, weapon that is art. going that is going to be the theme of the rest of the year. They may have a sentence in there that like supported Squadron 42. The ships are done for Squadron. Hands down. They've said as much. So until Squadron 42 episode 2 starts up, no more hidden ships. Which means around the middle of the year, ships are going to be coming out fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, so this first bit has me just stupid excited. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know if I'll ever, if I'll have time to do it. You know, it, it's something I've been wanting to do, but I, I, I'm, I'm really all in on the give them hope project. Um, but I do also have a, an outline for, um, a video, um, uh, regard uh, uh, surrounding the stuff that we're going to talk about on the, the next spectrum pulse with quantum. But um, I've always wanted to do a video on the Polaris and why it's the most versatile multi crew, you know, uh, multi crew ship in the verse and talk about all its features. Cause it is the Swiss army knife of multi crew ships. And I just love it. Um, and I, I bought it literally in the concept sale, like, Day one, you know, like minute five <laughs> when it was released <laughs> in 2016. Um, and so I've been waiting for this for a long time and I'm just uh, super happy to see it being in production and, and hear and read about it as well as, you know, having seen the the imagery that we saw at Citizen Con as well as the um, the concept uh, interior that they did uh, at IAE. They showed off, I think it was IAE in 2022, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. uh, during I got Polaris or, sorry. back in twenty two. Oh Currently boy! Buy back. So, um, art uh, ships ship art, and it's all Star Citizen side. Uh, and of course, we've got the Zeus here looking lovely. Um, big fan of the Zeus. I don't have one, but I'm I'm a fan. Not gonna lie. Uh, last month, progress was made on the RSI Polaris with the exterior progressing to Lod Zero. So the exterior. And this is one thing that people always, they, they see Lot Zero like, ah, it's level, you know, it's, it's in final art. And it's like, no, no, no. The exterior is at final art. That's the, the exterior is just a small amount of the, 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 the surface area of the, the overall ship, you know, because we still have the, the internal uh, surfaces and stuff with the exterior progressing to level of detail zero. Um, so the what they do is they uh, LO, LOD, level of detail, level of detail zero is the highest level of detail, the detail that it looks like when your face is here. And then they also do the level of details as you march out at intervals to different distances um, for the ship to a certain point. So um, they've done the first level of detail. They still need to do the others beyond that for the exterior. And the interior is approaching its gray box review. So it's not gray box complete, but it's approaching its gray box review. So keep that in mind. Um, and gray box oftentimes will look kind of like this with uh, some more of the greebling on board. And they'll do some, they'll add some color to sort of get the theme started for different interior spaces and such. Um, but it's, it's not high level of detail. Um, so the interior still has a lot of work to do, but they, um, so some interior sections were worked up to a, uh, were worked up to establish a visual target. So they're probably going to be, um, above, you know, beyond gray box, um, with some, um, 
you know, some basic lighting passes and some different textures and uh, color palettes and everything, uh, while others were redesigned to accommodate gameplay and improve alignment with the art direction. You know, I'd be curious to know what they mean by accommodate gameplay as in like uh, what what gameplay parts. So are they talking about engineering and being able to remove, you know, um, some components? Because they all of them, as far as I know, are large and above. Um, and large components we will not be moving. Large and above. Um, large components will have to be um, uh, replaced at a space station. Capital components will have to be replaced at a capital class dock. So keep that in mind. Um, but it, it is making actually, you know, in my opinion, really good progress. Like it's moving along pretty quickly. Now, Invictus Launch Week ready quickly? No, I don't think so. In, in two more months? Uh, no, we're, we're, we're not going to be that far. Um, not, with, not with Gray Box mm-hmm. only just being reviewed now for the yeah. interior. And... I think it's important to denote because it's being built with this is going to be the first capital ship uh, and really the first big ship built with resource management and engineering in mind, you know, from the ground up, not like refactored or anything like that, you know, from the ground up there. And I think that's why they say accommodating gameplay. Because they're they're like, okay, we need to do this for resource management. We need to do that for resource management. Um, and resource management is targeting uh, to release with 4.0 in summer. So I think the Polaris is a 4.0 ship. I think we're going to see it in summer, whenever 4.0 comes. There's another thing, Tacton. Holy crap. Mm-hmm. It's big. Really big. Yeah. Um, I, but yeah, I the... can imagine, because we're getting so many developers swapped over from Squadron and how much work they put into Star uh, Squadron 42 over the past three years just to get all the ships done, I imagine, um, and one of the reasons I, I was thinking about this is Access and Sat said, let us name the Polaris. Um, that's supposed to be able to be done on every ship. So is the customization stuff from the 300i. Um, and so... What are these devs to do if we if we don't necessarily need a more higher throughput of ships, which we don't technically need? We're getting like five a patch. That's way too many. That's like no one nobody needs five new ships a patch. Like that's insane. So what they could do instead of building new ships or backlog ships, they could be fixing and finishing the ships that are, are in game, uh, or starting up the vehicle work for scanning, so we can get some of the other ships that have zero gameplay herald. Mercury, the unreleased uh, cutter, into the game and work out those. We also have a, a retrofit for all the resource management and a couple other things that are coming in. And like the doors on the Carrick and the Caterpillar, cargo doors still haven't been worked on. I know it's waiting for modularity, but it's fine. <laughs> So, like, there's stuff they can do that's not necessarily making more ships. Because they have a lot more for, uh, workforce now. Yeah, it, new ships um, and updating ships to gold or current gold standard, working on the, um, you know, uh, new as in new concepts as well as and then catching up on the backlog. And, you know, Nazareth and I talked about this when we did our big segment on the ship backlog and the ship pipeline. And that was like, what, two years ago? Oh, my. No, that, that was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, or, that was last, last year. year. And we we did, we had not really talked about. We had like theorized like the shift over, but we mm-hmm. didn't really talk about it because we didn't really know where that was going to hit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we so didn't we know where didn't it was going to hit, gonna... but we knew that. Yeah, we, we talked about Went how uh, yeah, squadron ship yeah. development. There's a lot of ship development that's been going on in Squadron because they have these massive capital ships. You know, think, if you think about, you know, for you know, as an example, we talk about the Polaris and how so much work is needed just to get the Polaris up to lot zero on the exterior. And it's a, a, a ton of work to do the interior to that level. Imagine how much work it is to do that for the Bengal, the Javelin, the Idris. Holy shit. We have more ship tonnage in those three ships than we do in all of the ships combined in the PU by a long shot. And that's just those three 
you know, human capital ships. We're not talking about the uh, the levels of detail on the exteriors of the the Vanduul capital ships, which are supposedly don't have interiors. Um, but still, it's a ton of work to make them fly, to make them function, um, and, and everything else that goes into squadron. That's so much work. That's so and there's so many man hours for resources that are going to be moving into the PU. But then those developers who put in those man hours are t- going to bring that experience and those tool sets and everything, you know, the lessons learned back into vehicle production for the PU. And that's why this whole idea of like, Oh, it's going to take 10, 10 years. And it's like, why would it take 10 years? If in 10 years they have done the Bengal, the Idris and the Javelin and you know, God knows how much more, you know, it's like, no, that that's not, you know, and 10 years and we're, we're getting all that, manpower and uh, development resources focused on PU ships after completing squadron ships. And then we're also hiring for more teams and they have improved tools. Uh, this is what Nazareth and I talked about. And I hate to say it, but uh, you know, um, you know, like uh, uh, Blizzard needs to do his, uh, you know, however many points it is for funny hat for Nazareth's stream. Cause oh, we need boy. like profit hats. You know, we <laughs> talked about this yeah, and, and we weren't crazy and we had citations, but people didn't hear those citations. People hadn't seen it before. Um, you know, and this is the plan. You know, this is what John crew has been talking about. This is what gave John crew an ulcer. He's in the hospital right now. Cause of you people, <laughs> <laughs> they I'm didn't joking. Lose I don't... Yeah. Their head of director. They replaced them. Mm-hmm. They're not without a head. Uh, the current theory is that, they, because of all the teams merging over from Squadron, there was there only needed one head or lead project manager, basically. One of them needed to go, because we had a star system in Squadron 1. One of them needed to go. I and do so, not see a impact on development from um, uh, Todd Pappy leaving at all. Right. He's the director. They're going to be so busy with moving the features over from squadron and bringing star citizen up to feature parity with squadron over the next year. There isn't a, yeah. And Jake Ross, they are, they are, wasn't upper he also managers. squadron? Was it, they are was upper it squadron. They are upper management and, and development studio leadership. They are not the people who are doing the work and those people who are doing the work know what they need to do. They have a plan. They've been going through all this. And really, I only think that Todd Pappy left because he wasn't w- willing to or, or able to move to the UK. Because he's been in Washington. He's been working remotely. And they're like, we need you in the PU. And for whatever reason, he can't. You know, I I mean, he's he is a family man. He has a wife and kids. You know, that was part of the reason he talked about that when they were talking about the impact of COVID. You know, and productivity, productivity, he has a wife and kids or, or at least a spouse and kids. I'm not, I don't want to say wife. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to assume. Um, so according to LinkedIn, obviously not the end all be all of information, but Jake Ross was only a lead producer, a lead producer. Yeah. The, I don't lead think it's going to have in a, an in impact on development at all. Size of CIG. They probably have 10 of him at least. Oh, more than that. You know. You've got lead producers for every every single every team. Know, team of any significance. But Todd Pappy isn't doing any coding. Todd, Todd Pappy is, you know, he he's the a general equivalent. Um and there are multiple generals. So there are multiple other people, you know, in leading this project. His departure, he's going to be missed. You know, I think he's a great guy. I think he's had a huge um, you know, a, a, a lot of um influence on the development of the project and everything like that. But he is replaceable and I don't think, you know, he left CIG on bad terms and left them, you know, in a state where like, Oh God, what do we do No, <laughs> Especially when they know what they need to do. Well, we need to move these future features over to the PU and integrate them and be at the PU up to the squadron standard, you know, and, and there's nothing that Todd is going to do to impact any of that. You know, like if, you know, I mean, if, if CR left, we'd probably be better off, but <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it's he. He's one. He's one person. He's one person, and the 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 fate of the you know, the fate of the project doesn't isn't hinged on one person. And even 
you know, it, I I don't think we're going to see barely a hiccup. Yeah, you know, just because if they... I think the biggest hiccup will just be in scheduling and uh, leadership style, which will just be more like changing direction, not slowing direction. If he made, if his departure may, uh, creates a significant uh, a negative impact on the development of the PU, then he was not leading appropriately. He was not doing his job. Because that means the people who are the upper management of the different departments and teams below him can't function without him. And that's not how you're supposed to lead a team. That's not how you're supposed to lead a company. That's not how you're, you're supposed to have people be able to function like that. They need to know what to do. They need to know, you know who they need to collaborate with and how to communicate. Those people also need to have some familiarity on how to do the job for the people above them. You know, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I, we, we wish him the best of luck, but I, I don't think, you know, I think it's a blown way out of the proportion of the impact that uh, his departure would have. Um, so anyway, back to ships. Um, so this is interesting, and this is what uh, I think it was Lady Space Patrol was talking about earlier. Um, two upcoming variants progress through the pipeline. Upcoming variants. They don't say what they are variants of. They just say upcoming variants. They don't say if they're unannounced. Which is interesting because a lot of times they will say if they if it's unannounced they will generally say that, but they don't say um, uh, if, if 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 it's an unannounced ship. So that was the difference between the cutter when they were working on the variants. They didn't say an unannounced ship. They just said upcoming variants. So I do think that uh, and I don't know who was saying it. I don't know if it was Lady Space Patrol or someone else. I do think that these are variants of an existing uh, or I mean, or at least announced. The G twelve comes ship. out with three variants. Yeah, the yeah. I mean, it could be a it could be a concept like the G twelve, or they could be talking about uh, variants of you know maybe they're variants of the. Do they mention the? No, they mentioned the Zeus. So I mean, they I yeah they're who knows who knows what they're variants of. But I think the G twelve is probably a good guess. Um. Yeah. So one continued its LOD zero pass, the other passing the LOD zero gate review. The latter then moved on to final damage and LOD passes with its UV2. I always forget what UV2 is. UV2 is the the, the way they're doing their damage, uh, the state, not state, damage, damage map thing. Basically, a way to texture the ships that let you rip the texture off the ship. When you shoot it, it burns away. When you salvage it, you fizzle it out. Mm -hmm. I see. Oh, that's a good it's point. A way, it, um, it's a way to East, texture that East 1975 uh, mentions uh, from our, our, our orange presentation with John Crew, the meta uh, and... Yeah, and Ursa variant. I think uh, I agree. Medical Ursa, um, and then the Argo cargo. And those are both variants. The, the Argo they showed is the utility version they've already built for Squadron. Yeah, and it's not really a variant, so hmm. more like a gold path on it. Like the, well, the Ursa, hundred percent. Yeah, I do hmm. want to know what that new uh, Anvil ship is, though. Yeah. Or Anvil looking. Yep, I agree. I, I want yeah. it. Uh, the where's, where's gold mini standard. Carrick? Yeah, the gold standard pass continued for the Aegis Retaliator, Woot, uh, which is currently awaiting gray box gate review. Um, feedback from a recent sanity review. <laughs> oh, God, they're checking each other's sanity now. <laughs> is oh, currently wow. underway. The ship's base, cargo, and bombing torpedo modules are also progressing well following minor art direction feedback. Um, Spoiler warning! I think this is modularity. This is the first ship that's getting it. <laughs> yep, and um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this is for uh, Invictus launch week and a uh, feature for three twenty three. You think they're going to get from a gate, a uh, gray box gate review to modularity and? two months oh i think that the modularity is hey we've already done this and yeah. they're just getting the ship ready that's going to introduce it and they're going to say hey this ship is now modular 
and we're going to be working on you know remember when they did you know how they do the all ship uh, uh SEL they always do it for IAE and for Invictus Launch Week I think they're going to talk about their plans for the modular ships that come after they're going to announce hey the retaliator is now modular modular here are the modules for it that we're now selling you can use these in game and then here is our plan. Talk, we're going to talk about it a little bit on ISC, um, you know, when they show off the new Retaliator Gold Standard. And then they're, you know, during SCL, they're going to detail their plans for this ship and this ship and this ship going, you know, forward. That would be my my pie in the sky hope. Um, here we go. They talk about two unannounced. See, they specifically uh, say unannounced vehicles, but they're not not variants, but the vehicles past their lot zero gate review. So two unannounced vehicles, different vehicles, uh, with only one minor issue to resolve between them. Uh, both will now move into the final phase of development that implements damage meshes and lots. So the additional level levels of detail and the da- uh, damage meshes. The RSI Zeus. Pardon me. Is approaching the end of Gray Box. So here we are. This is kind of what Gray Box looks like. Um, with the team polishing geometry around the ship, a redesign of the cargo hold is nearly complete. Ooh, I wonder what they changed. Um, I imagine it's something to do with the tractor beam and to allow, allow better for 32 SCU containers to get in after learning uh, uh, from the C1, because that's a. Just just Disaster. don't pull a Mercury and make it twice the size just to fit Nurse in the back. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Um, a Second. redesign of the cargo hold is nearly complete, as are changes to the inner frame of the ramp and ramp piston mechanism. Uh, additional high-frequency detail was added to help increase the illu- illusion of inner structures between the exterior hull and chassis. Uh, While maneuvering thrusters on the nose were moved to allow for better integration into the surface. A redesign of the ship-to-ship docking ring. I'm so glad that they're giving us a docking ring. I... I... I I worry that... It's kind of like RSI style, though? It is, but I, I also worry that... Um, not enough ships have it, and they're going to have to go back and redo um, a lot of ships to incorporate those. Um, or at least I hope so. I like the docking rings. I think more ships need them. I think it will be... Because they don't really show any slowing down with ships, and they very obviously will build new ships to take the spot of older ships... Basically, no one's going to be flying a Constellation after the Zeus comes out. <gasps> oh, um, no. But I have the, the uh, die-cast model, man. It'll, it'll, it'll be an old relic. It's it's fine. It, it's, it'll be an older ship, an older design. Like That happens. People move on. Designs improve. Anyway, uh, I think it will be one of the things you d- actually have a choice in. Do I get this model of a ship, like the Constellation has all these docking rings and things, or do I get this newer one where it's a bit smaller, they slimmed it down a bit, so they removed the docking ring so I can only land in a hangar. I know that's not a great example because the Zeus has one, obviously, but that kind of question could be applied to ships once we have enough of them, making more minute choices between two ships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, and my, the way I'm thinking about it is for rescue. Your ship is disabled. You are injured. You're, you know, leaking atmosphere. And um, someone has to EVA to come onto your ship to help you. Versus docking and repressurizing and it's able not to the walk floor, in. floor, is it? No. Where, no, it's in the there? side. It was over on the, the left-hand side, if I remember correctly. Uh, I'll keep reading. Um, a redesign of the ship-to-ship docking ring door and frame was done to better fit the RSI, RSI aesthetic while the mess hall was highly polished. The ship's habitation is currently being updated. The central hallway bulkheads were widened to allow for better navigation and consistency too. Uh, that was actually something I was worried about when they, they showed us the uh, sort of interior model. I felt that those seemed to be awfully narrow. Um, Polish 
polish was completed on another new ship uh, while yet another progress through white box. There's a lot of ship development going on. Um, white box, gray box, and L- LOD. So that's going to be something really small. Probably, I would say, a ground vehicle, a small ground vehicle or a hover vehicle. We got those trio of bikes. Yeah. A, fi- a final lighting pass will be done soon before damage and LOD work. So a polish was completed on another new ship, and I wonder if this is that one that they talked about where it seemed like they were reviving it after years of it sitting on the shelf waiting for its time. Remember when we talked about that last month? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's it for ship art. And let's see, for weapon art, we'll start on the PU side, and then there's uh, um, some on the squadron side as well. Yep. All right. Now, either we need to go a lot faster, or I'm going to need to jump off in the middle. Um, Aether Drift 369 thank you for hanging out have a good night we'll talk to you later 07 have a good one I don't know what you want because it's like I can't work art weapons PU uh, yeah 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 uh, but somewhere soon I'm gonna need to go or we need to swift get through the rest of this All right well uh, we'll get as much so, done until then okay uh, Weapon Art worked through the host of updates planned for 323, including scope magnification and optic improvements. The aim is to overhaul, overhaul the whole scope system and bring it up to modern FPS standards. The existing iron sights across all weapons were updated too. Alongside this, updates were made to improve and streamline reloading across all weapons. Then over on squadron side... February saw the weapon team improving wear maps across all FPS weapons. They also redesigned iron sights along the alongside the screen sizes for dedicated tools like the multi-tool. The bearing P for a R rifle was also reworked. Was reworked and various improvements were made uh, to the fire extinguisher too. Oh, um, I have a thing that broke. That's gameplay story. Apparently, I'm going to do the game play story too. It will screw it up if I don't. Go for it. Uh, gameplay story. Gameplay story began in February, February, updating a number of scenes in Chapter 16 with the newly standardized helmet setup, which they talked about last month. Uh, it felt great, says Gameplay Story, to get these scenes finished off and to see the helmet animation animating nicely as the characters put it on. Gameplay Story team. Oh, the flip. Uh, yep. The flip taking on and off. Now they actually have animations to actually just do the whole taking off of the helmet and your head's there and stuff. It's great. Um, the team also began receiving new facial animations and mastered audio, allowing them to complete several existing scenes. Alongside this, new motion capture enabled significant updates to a range of scenes. For example, a two person scene in Chapter 4 was reshot to account for a new location and start poses, significantly improving the overall scene. Uh, Polish was done for Chapter 1, and a small <laughs> significant uh, update was made to the cast in Chapter 14. Polish dogs for everybody in chat. <laughs> All right. Uh, back to me for community. Community. Correct? Yep. Okay. So, the community team supported two major events in February, Red Festival and Core More, the latter with a first date in the verse screenshot contest and a guide to enjoying activities together. Uh, when I tried to get my wife to play Star Citizen once, uh, she got super nauseous um, while we were Aww. flying and she was sitting in the backseat of the Hornet on my other PC um, and had to run to the bathroom and vomit. I have it on video, Aww. or at least you can hear it in the background. Yeah. So, we won't be doing that again. <laughs> Um, hundreds of pictures and videos taken by the community during the events are available to view on the community hub. Uh, the team then supported various community events. Congratulations to everyone in the French speaking community who participated in the destination cachet cachet mm-hmm. event. Mm-hmm. It's cachet. Uh, cachet. The puzzles were particularly well thought out, putting each of the four teams to the test. A pirate team nearly captured a participant, and the security teams had their share of fun as well. We hope that everyone enjoyed participating or watching their favorites on Twitch. We also want to bow to everyone who fought in the recent Verse at War 2, or Verse at War 2nd Edition. We loved seeing everyone fighting for their teams in early February. Uh, March is coming quickly, and we're eager to follow the action during the next 
during the next Crux Cup from Anzia Racing. Ready, set, go. Community team. Uh, the community team uh, continued detailing the weekly and monthly schedules with this week in Star Citizen and this month in Star Citizen. Uh, they also officially announced CitizenCon 2954, which returns to Manchester, UK, October 19th and 20th. The team is already deep in planning for the event and want to remind you all to not miss this one. Of course. And I won't be able to be there. Uh, I, let's I see. still say Squadron. I still say Squadron is coming out. As oh. much as Paul says it's not, like, there. Last time they said don't miss this, they said feature complete. And by the way, server meshing works. So, like, we're getting server meshing in the middle of the year. It's not going to be like, oh, look, server meshing's live now. So that's not going to be it. It's not anywhere near close to saying Star Citizen 1.0. So what else could it be? I think it's when they start the marketing campaign um, and say and, and the, give a release date. I think that's way too late. I think it's way, way too much time. That's seven months away. And so if we haven't started the marketing campaign in the very near future, it's it, we're, we're, we're not we're not giving enough time before release. That's just my thought. Um, finally, the team updated the Arena Commander schedule, which keeps players up to date with Arena Commander's rotating game modes. They also have been working on a variety of initiatives to support the upcoming release of Alpha 323, 4.0, and beyond. Notice how they say Alpha 323, 4.0, and beyond. No 324. There is no plan for a 324. 324 would just get in the way. Uh, and that is it for community on the PU side. Oh boy! And now we well, there's, are... there's no squadron community. He's yeah. not out yet. Core gameplay for the PU. Everyone ready for a three mile read? Yeah, the the big pillar, pillar grande. Oh boy! <sighs> February, Febu- I cannot say February. February saw a core gameplay pillar continue to refine. Uh, continue to refine and improve a new backpack reloading ahead of QA testing. For example, magazines are now repacked in the player's inventory, so multiple half-empty bags condensed into fewer full ones. Yay! No Woot. more having a whole bunch of uh, clips and magazines all over the ground. Now, uh, support my gives- question is, huh? do the empty mags just get dumped, or do they persist in your backpack and you can fill them with ammunition later? Or do they just well, disappear? You, that would assume you have another half-empty one. Well, I, I'm I'm wondering if like, can you brought you know buy a crate of 200 rounds of ammo, and then you know, like, do you have to hold on to your magazines? Ah, uh, okay, I see. Can you buy bullets or is it only magazines? Yeah, exactly. Do do bullets question. only um, come in magazines? Yeah. SCL this week is FPS. You can put it in the in the thing. Yep. Uh, support continues for ongoing scope updates, including correctly folding down iron sights when sights are attached. Support for blur on the outside of sights is currently underway. The team also enabled weapon customization UI to look more holographic ahead of a UI styling pass. Um, oh, okay, they, they did say the empties the... would be discarded. Got it. Good. Thank you, Scabro. Ah. Scabro. Um. And they they have said the what we're getting in 323 for the scopes is not what they showed off in Squadron or not Squad CitizenCon. Um, it is kind of a half step between he, here and there. Um, with the whole whole system is still planned, just they weren't able to do that much work in the time they wanted to. Yeah, we're not getting all of it for 323. We're getting part of it. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like a half step what they're mm-hmm. what they're doing with the scope specifically um because it does still zoom in a lot of the screen and it's not as polished as we saw the feature being in um in CISCon. it is there's a there's basically a graphics rework they have to do after this yeah because it is a, a it is graphically intensive that's like that's why tarkov yes. can lag really bad yeah yes yeah yeah it was tarkov um, that does it right yeah, Tarkov has so what they what they do in Tarkov is what they do in in um what's it called Squadron Portal. There we go. Mm. Uh, which is cameras. They have multiple cameras. So every time you put on a scope on your gun, it's 
that's a new camera. So your camera can see all the things, and that camera is projecting onto the scope. And then, so you're looking a camera in a camera, so that's twice as much rendering for your computer. Same thing Portal does. When you shoot a portal at the wall, it creates a camera looking out so it can project what is out on the other side of the portal. Picture in picture. Lot, picture in picture, lots of... And it's not just like, oh, it's just a picture. It's literally rendering the scene multiple times. Just think of how how bad it is rendering Star Citizen once. Try running it twice. <laughs> Try running it every time somebody puts a scope on their gun. So... It, it They need to find a solution that makes everything happy. And so they're going to do this half-step, and they're going to R&D it for the future. Um, for item wear and misfire, further work was completed on the accumulator system. Additional tools were implemented to make working and testing the system easier, too. So accumulator is picking up bits in the environment and adding it to your gun. So if you're in a sandy place, you get like buildup of sand on your guns. Uh, if you're in a snowy place, build up ice, oil, etc., etc., etc. For the player mud. interaction, this will make it what? Uh -huh. Mud. Mud. Yes, mud. Mm -hmm. um, you drop your space AK in the mud, you pick it up, and it keeps firing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Am I not understanding a quote happening? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people will like this one. Uh, for player interaction, the team spent uh, a lot of time bug fixing and polishing. They also added a game option to hide the F prompt and added a new control hint for when an off-screen interaction is available. So yes, confirmed, you will be able to shut off the press F button on the UI to interact with everything in front of you. It will just be what it is and what it does. Uh, the devs then added the ability to show the loot screen from the interaction wheel. Players will now auto crouch if an object is they're looting is below them support was added to automatically open the ui in, or the inventory ui instead of a loot screen if the lootable container is above a certain capacity uh the team also the team the team are working yeah, the, nope that's just broken the team are also working on a replacement for the legacy quick buy ui using building blocks i thought shops were building blocks anyway i don't know how that is not but the rest of it is not sure. Uh, this will also be used for renting vehicles during events. Oh, it's when you walk up to a thing and buy it. Okay. Got it. Okay. We're continued on Freight Elevator, Kiosk UI, Backend 2. For the ongoing Visor Lens HUD rework, progre progress continued on various UI elements, including priority notifications, mission objectives, and chat. Regarding EVA... Core gameplay continued to implement and improve network support or networking support to ensure that players' arms are held and arms and yeah, are held arms and held arms and held entities. There we go. Not are held arms and held entities don't clip into the torsos when traveling or traversing uh, and rotating. For prone players will be forced out when they when they perform actions that require them to crouch, such as melee attacks. Uh, for such as melee attacks, further locomotion improvements were made in collaboration with the animation team too. For master mode, core gameplay continued working with design to tune archetypes. They have so far completed around ninety percent of the initial conversion, initial. with further tuning. Yes, initial conversion mm -hmm. with further further tuning passes and refinements to be done before release. Yeah, um, what we get so, initially is not set in stone, and they Can't also emphasize that enough. Absolutely, and the so they're placing everything in an archetype, and they expect to have some time to go back, probably for the most popular ships, to tune them out of those archetypes. So let's say they they drop the Hornet into medium fighter and then they say well it's going to be a bit slower a bit lumbering but it's going to be able mm -hmm. to do this better instead so they're going to drop them into their archetypes and then tune them where they think they should be it's just to mm -hmm. get a bulk starting point instead of having to spend you know six months on every ship trying to tweak everything till it's perfect um i also like something that um uh Nubifier said today for racing specifically and basically remove the assumption of everything as combat 
so that racing can basically stay almost where it is, but you're in a racing kind of thing. The second you put a gun on it, you're in the master mode system. If you remove guns and set it up correctly, you can have a racing ship that is a racer and basically sidesteps master modes. Realistic would be it would be its own mode that has this kind of shields and uh, speed that specifically for racing and safety in racing. But I really like that, like you neuter your ship and take off all the weapons and, and downgrade your weight class to a racing ship level then you can get into this racing mode. But the second you put a gun on it, you have to get back in the master modes because that's balance. They're balancing it specifically to get specific combat. So stopping combat means they don't need to worry about balancing it for combat. I do think that there's a lot of emphasis on the archetypes that they talked about. And that isn't an all-inclusive list. I think no. people think that and, that's but, an all-inclusive list. Racing ships like, is no, a that's big all... question, though. Yeah. All racing ships are a big question. Mm -hmm. because it's it's weird mass modes is just weird for racing yep and it's it yeah there's there's plenty of problems in both directions argo cargo racing mode no <laughs> racing ships will have racing mode even though the argo cargo doesn't have weapons it's not a racing ship just like you can't have not a torpedo with mode without torpedoes on your ship it's a thing just makes sense. Uh, I recommend you go watch the new Fire video. He explains it way better than I can. Uh, let's see. Work continued on jump points, as we talked about earlier, with the team implementing mm -hmm. and updating alignment mechanics. A new UI was added, uh, also added to give players information on whether their ships are capable of traveling or completing travel. So, will you run out of fuel in the middle? Now we know. Successful tests transitioning between Stanton and Pyro across the two separate systems were completed too. We know. And we, we have did now it. had players cross a jump point. Yep. Uh, for research and network and engineering, heat gameplay uh, was added. I'm so excited. Finally. Finally back. Thank goodness. I, I, I don't know why, but heat gameplay is, is something that I think really uh, makes ships and and industrial equipment live there's even a space engineers mod that i really like and most building mechanics that i think of for designing in games use a heat mechanic to force the player to spread out because like in minecraft you can take a furnace doesn't matter if you put a bucket of lava in the furnace you can sack fifty thousand uh furnaces right next to each other with no heat problems you will literally melt the furnace or the furnace next to the furnace if you put that much heat in one spot so i really like heat mechanics which have factory blocks or factory mechanics generate radiation or radiative heat so you can't place stuff too close to it or it will melt it <laughs> heat was always supposed to be one of the great one of the great equalizers between yes. small and larger and capital ships yes. especially when it comes to um quantum travel the idea is that you would be uh, able to um not dissipate, but you, you're, well, dissipate because of your coolers, you would be able to quantum travel farther and at a greater speed or a, a mixture of the both with your larger ship, not only because your ship can generate a more powerful quantum field and go faster, but also because you have greater ability with co your, your coolers to dissipate the heat generated by your, your power plant and your, your quantum drive. So that way you wouldn't have to drop out of quantum to cool down uh, as soon as a smaller ship and that was meant to be the great equalizer this is why we have such large systems in star citizen because we have such large you know ships and capital ships that are meant to be able to, to quantum for much longer periods before having to stop quantuming due to heat you know that that's one of the main we don't experience that in santa because it's 5 au but you're meant to be able to experience that in null which is 120 au you know you, you'd Give be able to get yeah, you'd be able to get, you know, 15, 20, 30 AU before you'd have to stop and let your coolers do their job and bring everything back down to normal and then start the next jump. You know, it, it would be a succession of jumps. So, yeah. Yeah. So heat gameplay was added 
which enables items to generate heat based on their usage. Items will require coolant if necessary and will overheat and degrade in functionality if not addressed. How do you think fires start? Well, yep. that plus electrical fires. Life support is now fully integrated into the resource network with the life support generator and tank now functional. And both Woot. of these things are going to be tested in 323 inside Arena Commander with the new engineering, um, what are they called? Testing versions. What are they called? Oh, the... Experimental modes. Ex yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, improved debugging tools were added for the room system to help better understand how resource network and life support interoperate. Uh, for scanning or for radar and scanning, core gameplay this is exciting. Complete, <laughs> completed a refactor to reduce the number of radar components on vehicles and share data between seat operators. Previously, each seat operator had a unique radar. Now, vehicles can share a single radar across all operators. This means that a pilot or radar operator can focus on collecting radar and scan results that are then shared between all vehicle turrets. So your co-pilot in a uh, hammerhead can be finding the targets while the pilot's piloting, and then the turret's being picking those targets up and using them instead of having to find their own targets. Yep. Everyone I has wonder, a job. <laughs> I wonder if this will also apply to things like the mole and the arastra. I very much expect it to be. Yeah, I think that's. I think that, it's the same the system, but I don't things. know. Yeah, how that's frustrating what, is that? It, right? it, it it says like, um, what did it just say? Um, yes, radar and scanning results. Scanning results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because every time you start scanning, it, it screws up something for somebody else. Yeah, yep. yep, yeah. Multi mole uh, mole mining is just kind of weird. Also. Mm -hmm. Soft death in a mole is, is death to three of your crewmates. Because <laughs> um, the, the turrets, how yeah, they they go out of the ship, they like extend. When you lose mm -hmm. power, they can't retract. Oh, and you can't get up. <laughs> so when you, you, you have three people in these little pods that just cannot get up. And they can't get out of the stupid seat, you know, even though they're yep. exposed to vacuum yep. and EVA. Oh, man. Yep. What a design it's flaw. It's a death sentence. <laughs> yep. As God, of, like, I, fix that soon. I thought you were better than this. Um, Fuck you, okay. Space Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> rather, each turret need, rather than each turret needing to scan themselves. While it's still possible for vehicles to contain multiple radars in time, the team will merge the majority into a single shared unit that will not only improve performance, but gameplay too. And having multiple radars will be more of a added function than a necessity. That's a huge, Again, this is, this paragraph is a huge quality of life improvement. Quality of uh, life. And well also of, it means they're working on radar and scanning. Yeah. And, and remember when the scout released and everybody's like, you know, there's ship that doesn't have its gameplay. Well, you can scan, you know, it does have its gameplay. It's just not, and they the, did say on the stage, final form. Hey, this is something we're going to get, get going in the next year. And here we are. Like, it's a huge quality of life yeah. thing, and it's also a uh, their exp This is going to expand the functionality, and so this is like this is a, a very important paragraph within the monthly report. Um, yeah, a lot of really great stuff. But I think that this is one of those ones that you know all of a sudden we're like, oh, hooray! They're working on this. This is great. You know? Yep. I I wouldn't like. I don't know. I don't think they do radar. Uh, scanning update and 4.0 but it is half the map system so mm -hmm. the map's coming in 3.23 maybe it's right there maybe it's a little farther off oh, yep. uh, the team also supported elevators for the upcoming instance hangar yeah, instance hangers and supported quantum travel and marker reworks alongside server meshing when transitioning to a new solar system for oh, Arena Commander, yeah. the team concluded engineering work for streaming. This technology allows Arena Commander to utilize any persistent universe location with ease and avoiding duplicating plants or other object containers, which was previously required to call expensive locations such as cities and space stations, a.k.a. The, they couldn't really bring in any location because if it was near something like a city, 
you they have to do a lot of work to it. Now they can just bring the entire thing in and put their borders around it and not care that Babbage is right there. Yep. Well, and, and you can they see. could even they could even but because it's streaming, you could have a large scale map for racing that incorporates a city or something like that. And oh, yeah. When you're not in that entity zone, it's not streamed in. It's not impacting your performance. And then as you tr- cross into that entity zone, then it loads Ooh, in if this New was... Babbage or Hurston or something like that for racing. I wonder if this was a you know, prerequisite or, or for else. Tau. That would make sense. I Yeah, because be you're surprised. supposed to be fighting on the ground and air than space. So it's all one map. So they would need mm-hmm. to do something. They, yeah, they'd need to be... Because you wouldn't want to be having the whole thing uh, running on your PC, you know, having your, your client having to render both this, yeah. uh, your, your, your map on the ground, as well as all the space between you and that station. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. that's an interesting thought. I like that theory. I like it a lot. They said it's not dead. They said it's not dead. Not dead. Uh, Long inge- live theaters of war. <laughs> The engineering work for custom lobbies is nearing completion. Following mm-hmm. successful internal tests, the system is being handed off to QA for a re- release assessment. The team also began work on some basic custom settings, such as score limit, time limit, and cycle or match cycle options to provide players with more control over their lobbies. All hail custom lobbies return. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. It's been a long it has. road. Getting from there to here. Uh, I will enjoy it, especially with um, resource management coming in the next one and mm. custom lobbies, custom engineering lobbies. Oh, and, and training like the, sessions, anyone? Exactly. Yeah. Training, you know, training sessions, being able to get together with your org and practice these training sessions and set up scenarios where, mm-hmm. okay, this happens on your whole C. What do you do? And, and you, you run the drill. Do your, um, your your dropship training with uh, Winter Circle, I think, would be a great map to use. Oh my gosh, that'd be so cool! You know, not only being able to practice the flight, but also being able to allow for people to do the rapid disembark and reembark. Um, yeah, the 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 possibilities are are really not endless, but pretty far. I I hope they continue to add more um, custom settings. Yeah, I, definitely I hope they something really to be hyped about. On that. Yeah. Uh, what's next? Several internal tests were here conducted on engineering experimental mode. After an update to the backend matchmaker, new loads were created with all the equipment engineers will need for the mode. So normally you load in, you didn't have a multi-tool or a tractor beam or a repair gun, what have you. So now they need to you know put that in so you can actually do the mode that they're, you're loading into which is being prepared for go no go for an upcoming release we know when it's coming in that don't have to be so secretive uh the team also began focusing on the arena commander front end this makes me excited recently focus has been on functionality but now we're excited to improve not just the overall ux or user experience of arena commander but it's UI to bring it in line with the quality and style established across the rest of the game the core play- gameplay pillar I the first time I saw the new UI for Orion Commander, it was very like, yeah, it looks it looks like it will work, but it's it's not pretty. It's very functional. So I'm glad that like that was said. Like this is basically engineering art we have now. It's now it's time to make it look good. Um, good job, guys. You made it work and it worked well. Now it's time to make it look pretty. Uh, finally, we have three more pair. We have like five more paragraphs to go. Finally, the team completed the backend work f- required for Grav Royale. Oh, this must be just a reincarnated subsection of the teams. And other upcoming game modes and maps. They also continued to enable streaming across all maps while supporting the release of Alpha 322.1 with several fixes and quality of life changes. Core gameplay continued on an underlying mission system refactor ahead of server meshing. Further progress was made on the mission perks and reward system too, which should also be coming in 323, I believe, right? I think so. I think somebody said that. It may not be. It may not be till 4.0. It's part of reputation. Also. Uh-huh. The I forget so this, if they said. This is why the whole 
you know, if people are expecting server mission to come out real soon, mm, you need to curb your enthusiasm a little bit because they have to test these refactors of all the other systems that are mm-hmm. that tie into the services that tie into the servers. Yeah, because they everything said you that basically, you, yeah, every ephemeral thing that's not like an item on the server right now is lost when you cross the border. When you yep. when you jump, your missions are gone, your contacts are gone, everything's gone. Yeah, reputation. Uh, um, you know, your uh, the, there, there's all sorts of the issues and use case, uh, problems that arise yeah. that are things that aren't entity based, and those systems have been refactored, and so they have to test those refactored systems with this new system, not only to transition from Stanton to Pyro, but also to transition from Server One in Stanton to Server Two in Stanton. That's why this is the minimum viable product because they have to tra- test both those transitions because they consider them different. They they work differently in the way CIG has designed it. They talked about this in that um, fateful meshing together. ASC meshing together episode yeah. one. One of one sads. Yeah. Uh, core gameplay continued working on underlayer. Nope, now I already. I gotta go one. pee. I'll be right back. All right. An update was made to the reputation-based hostility. This is coming in 322, uh, 323. Ensuring that if anyone is being attacked, any nearby allied security faction members will come to their defense. This is very cool for me uh, because I don't really do PvP much. So if somebody's attacking me, I really like the game to help me out. Especially when I'm getting attacked at uh, Seraphim Station. And the station is just like, yeah, what, what, what do you want us to do about it? This also means that factions with negative reputation uh, with the player or with the attacked player will not intervene. So if Crusader don't like you, Crusader not help you. The contract manager was converted to building blocks in preparation for the new Moby Glass, which is also coming in 323. Further polished and UX or user experience improvements are currently underway in collaboration with the UI team. For persistence and instance hangers, work began on instance interior system this manager which this manages which hangar instance exists and needs to be created and which physical gateways are used to transition between the instance and the rest of the game world Uh, the team implemented the initial version of automatic cargo loading and unloading including displaying information on the asoft terminals that the ship is currently unavailable for retrieval due to being loaded or unloaded so if you guys saw in a couple weeks ago, last week, um, a, a sneak peek of just like a door on the bottom of a hangar, your ship will go into that to get loaded or unloaded automatically. Whereas if you want to keep your ship while you're loading or unloading it, you have to do it manually. So that's the yeah. s- system they're putting in for helping players who don't feel like spending all the glorious time moving boxes, which I find one of the most fun things in the game right now. <laughs> It's a cathartic thing, just like salvage is, just like mining is. Um, you know, it's an easy it's process. Boxes. Yeah, it's. Um, but this is something that Chad McKinney they, the... talked about with me at CitizenCon, and it's not just for the loading and unloading, you know, the automatic loading and loading of cargo. This is for if you want to have your ship repaired, you will have to exit the ship, and it will disappear down in the hole, and come back up repaired. If you want to change the components and the weapons out and such. And you're going to have someone else do it. It will go down to the hole over a period of time. It will get done and it'll come back, you know, come back up. And you can have your components, you know, as long as they're appropriate sized, come to you via a freight elevator and you can do the work. But if you want to pay to have the work done for you and you're going to go log out for the evening or go make a pit stop uh, and go buy some stuff or what have you, you know, you can two birds, one stone, you know, pay your 500 UEC to have the, the things changed out and your ship repaired and, and all that. Um, and this is to avoid having to physicalize all these actions um, because the amount of dev work that would be needed to do that would be astronomical. Um, yeah, we'll get there eventually. Just just not yeah. anytime soon. Yep. We got to get version one first, then we can start in these weird yeah, and that's exactly Simulator. what Chad McKinney said, is they do want to eventually have NPCs walking around, you know, replacing components and moving cargo for you. Um, but in the meantime, the tier zero version tech, you know, of it is, it, it happens, it happens, um, you know, in a sub hanger. And that way you can, 
go about your business in the meantime. Yeah, this and the sooner they get to one point the sooner the game one we stop using a UEC, we start using UEC and the game can finally start progressing instead of feeling like it's stagnating with all this development time. Um and basically like the game gets to start growing whereas currently it hasn't even reached birth yet. Yeah. So when well, when they when they a make lot those of stuff things happens happen, after they call one point Yeah, when they make it happen for real, it's a nice bonus. But it won't change the time of how long it takes. It'll just look cooler. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah, a, a right, thing that right. yeah. You know, but they can introduce the mechanic to us and have us get used to it. Um in the meantime, but eventually, you know, they can have NPCs you know, just like on your on the Stanton in Squadron Forty Two, they'll walk up and you know do the repair and replace the components and such. Um, you know, they do want to get to that full realized point, but that that isn't the first step. You know, it's a later step. Yep. Uh, progress was also made on the freight elevator and loading platform occlusion. That's what we just talked about, which determines where items can be placed on the elevator or platform. Figured. Support was also given to the <laughs> location team for marking up hangars with loading platforms and freight elevators. The loading platform is the big door, I assume? I think so. Okay. Interesting. Uh, finally, for core gameplay, the team worked on a various debug tool or various debug tools to aid in testing and debugging in various systems that drive instance hangars and or Instance hangers, the warehouse system and loading platforms. That's we've not really had them talk about warehouse system and loading platform. And unfortunately, I do have to go. That's okay. I will I will take it from here. All right. You got all the all the fun bits. You got narrative down there, you got VFX, UI, and I mean at least engine graphics. isn't on here with the gargantuan paragraphs that they had before that were super complicated, like I mean, it's kind of yeah. split up into core gameplay and graphics now. Most mm -hmm. of the engine stuff's in graphics. So, I bid thee all fare thee well. Um, I, I really hate to really hate to go, but I gotta be up in. That's okay. We understand. Six hours ish. You can make it up to me later. <laughs> oh boy! All mm -hmm. right. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good night, buddy. We'll talk me. later. Bye. Where's the buttons? And there he goes. All right. And he's off. And turn off the camera. There we go. All right. Continuing on. So economy team. Uh, la uh, on the Star Citizen side, there is no Star Squadron economy. Last month, the economy team made changes to bring salvage more in line with the PU's other careers. They're currently rebalancing commodities to improve the cargo career experience, too. So this is along with all the other work that they've been doing in order to basically set a baseline for the economy, like a starting point for when quantum does eventually get integrated with the game. This is the sort of baseline that they wanted at, and it will fluctuate around that baseline, you know, a little bit here and there more drastically for certain things surrounding events and such like that. But for the most part, this will be the, sort of wave that you ride is what they what they're looking for that sort of middle of the wave uh support was also provided for the xeno threat global event and the team looked began looking at fps ammo prices so um, if you saw if you saw that preview that cig put out um that's supposed to be it sounds like that's going to be um xeno threat related and let's see, next is graphics and VFX programming, and it's shared through to avoid. Uh, it says it's shared. Yeah, let's see. Okay, it's shared to here. Interesting. No. Okay, yeah, it's shared to here. Let's look. Your Fox system. Mm 
Hmm. Okay. So this one's a might not have been copied over perfectly. Object containers and zones, object containers and zones. Okay, so this part right here is where it starts being the P. Okay, cool. All right, so we'll read the shared aspect on the squadron side first, getting down to like moving object and zones. Got it. Okay. So graphics and VFX programming. Throughout February, and this is shared between squadron and the PU, uh, search says, and throughout February, the graphics team progressed with their long-term tasks. For example, work is nearing completion on the unification of gas cloud and planet cloud upscaling, which is great. You know, upscaling means that we can um, use the upscaling, oh, uh, the upscaling techniques uh, in order to make the clouds look great while also uh, improving performance. Though challenges caused by animated lights and, gla and gas clouds need to be solved. So uh, animated lights being um, your... Um, yeah, like the, the, the position lights on stations and ships, those sorts of things that, um, if, if it's animated and it moves around within a gas cloud, um, that can cause some issues. The gas cloud occlusion effect is also nearing completion, which will increase the detail level of all gas clouds, even in flat lit scenarios. Oh, that's exciting to hear about. I'm looking forward to seeing what that improvement looks like. The team also resolved a long-standing issue that caused a harsh line to appear when 600, I think it's probably meters, 600 meters from a, from where a gas cloud blends with the near fog system. Hmm. Not sure. Uh, the global illumination team continued to work on a system to approximate complex materials within a ray traced view of the world. Uh, last month, they began looking into performance improvements before tackling some of the more complex issues like moving objects and zones. Uh, and that's where it stops on the squadron. Hmm. Yeah, this didn't copy over right. Um, objects and zones. Where did this... Interesting. I don't know where this, there's a paragraph here that as was somewhere copied over from somewhere. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, this part is PU. Okay, so February, this is on the Star Citizen side, not Squadron. Um, and so I wonder if maybe Squadron is, you know, Vulcan is ready on the Squadron side? I don't know. Um, February saw the Vulcan team pushing hard toward release, working through various performance issues uh, such as compiler bugs caused by Vulcan's complex shaders. They also worked on a shader uh, shader caching mechanism to compile shaders while the game is loading to avoid hitch hitches. So um, they want your shaders to compile and load while you're loading the game rather than, uh, you know, you're loading from Windows rather than um, loading while you, once you get into the game. Because right now your shaders will compile and load um, as, you'd lo as you're, you're loading into the PU. So basically you, you click to enter the universe and they start compiling. And that's why the first time you log in for the day after a fresh start on your computer and such, it can take, it takes a while to load in all those shaders and your performance is bad for the first few minutes. And so they want to start that process beforehand rather than, um, you know, have it still be ongoing when you're waking up in your hab or from the bed on your ship. Uh, they're also considering whether this process can later run in the patcher to further reduce the chance of compiling when the game starts. Um, although progressing this may not be fully complete be by the initial public release. So it's uh, going to be an incremental improvement. Uh, let's see. To avoid hitches. I don't know where that came from. Yeah, okay, never mind. Um, 
and this next section is also so the the Vulcan this section was just in the PU this was this was shared this was not shared and then this is shared yeah right uh yep uh, devs from the Water Strike team closed out the issues that came up in the final review alongside several new features, including sign distance field interaction for accurate collisions when vehicles hit water and an improved water in- intersection shader. Um, so final review. I don't remember if that was on the release view for the roadmap or not. Do you guys remember? Uh, last month, the Planet Tech team began improving the editor workflow for cre- for creating planets and planning out the next version of Planet Tech V5. So improving the editor workflow for creating planets. Planet Tech V5 will cover a variety of areas, but the primary goals are to make creating planets quicker and easier and to try and achieve more diversity, density, and consistency in quality across whole planetary surfaces. So... We have Planet Tech V4. We've been in Planet Tech V4 for a while. V5 is what they talked about with the R&D regarding using artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to basically give it realistic data regarding different planet types so that way they can tell it that he, these are the parameters, These are, this is the type of planet we want, these are some of the parameters, ready, set, go. And it'll generate the sort of base of that planet, the sort of foundation for that planet before they move in and fine-tune it and customize it to how they want. Um, yeah, the and then this is... Yeah, the rest of the... And this is also shared between the two. So the rest of the graphics team focused on improving their upscaling tech ahead of its public release. And so this is what was just added to the release view this last week. The TSR, FSR, and I forget, was DLSS incorporated in there? I forget. Uh, Not DLSS yet, or did they mention it? Now I'm brain farting. Uh, This involved finalizing a new mesh format that gives major performance improvements. So... Um, we should be seeing a bit of a server performance improvement with um, the separation of the replication layer, but it looks like that we will also be seeing seeing some performance improvements on the client side as well. So that is it for graphics and VFX programming and Planet Tech. Now it's on to level design on the Squadron 42 side. So, uh, level design. The social narrative team continues to work on their focus chapters, the majority of which are Idris interstitials. So, in the parts uh, that you experience in the Idris in between missions. Uh, February's work involved making sure the chapter can play out from start to finish and that all narrative and scene content is present and correct. For example, ensuring that the medical flow is working, objectives and markers are in place, emails are set up, ship chat room content is present, mission brief text is updated, and the landing and takeoff sequences are correct. So that's a lot. A lot of content. A lot of stuff going on in between missions. Uh, Outside of interstitials, feedback was addressed and polishing was done for Chapter 1 and the Fortune's Cross and Shubin Archon locations. So, we have an answer to Nazareth's scanner anomaly from way back. Shubin Station and Archon Station are one in the same. Um, That was a long time ago. Now we are moving on to lighting. Uh, which is on the PU side, followed by a few more things on the PU side. So let's see. Where are we? Lighting. Lighting. Uh, February saw the lighting team continue to support various upcoming PU initiatives, including distribution centers, instance instanced hangers, freight elevators, and the new character customizer. This is actually a really great screenshot to show, you know, basically how lighting works to light a scene and the various points uh, uh, and sources of light and how they impact a scene.
Um, so locations EU. In February, the landing zone team worked with the feature team to finalize the working prototype for cargo and the new hangar experience. This is a big hangar. Look at that little tiny person and how big that hangar is. Final art and levels of detail are now nearing completion on all the modifications to hangars necessary for this exciting new feature. This is going to be a big change, everybody. This is a big change for how we interact with our ships and how we interact with hangars and our inventories at locations. It's going to be a bit of a learning curve, but I think after, you know, after a period, it's going to feel a lot more natural and it's going to be a lot better than what we've been used to. The Sandbox 2 team worked towards closing out the upcoming distribution centers. Uh, for example, art is being finalized and optimized while level design added the final tweaks to make sure the various areas can support all the gameplay the mission team want to add. I really can't wait to explore these. Um, and this is a pretty interesting shot too because you are at an external portion of the distribution center, but you're looking back at this monolithic structure. And it really helps to give you a sense of scale and understand that not all the gameplay is going to occur around this monolithic structure. There's going to be a lot of stuff to do in these sort of outlying and peripheral areas. Uh, and that's it for uh, locations, EU. Um, now on to mission design, which is also on the PU side of things. Last month, the mission design continued to work on a chain that comprises various mission types that scale in difficulty. Yeah, new learning curves would definitely hit the spot. It's going to bring, um, I think it's going to, uh, uh, all these new things that they're adding are going to reinvigorate the community. You know, it's been pretty active over the last year. We have gotten a lot of new stuff over the last year, but I think the experience is going to change so much that it's going to feel like a new game for those of us who have been around for, uh, for, for, for everyone, really. You know, this is the first step of making it a, a new game and a, a giving a, a big refresh to the overall experience and to show us what the, you know, the, uh, to, be, to give us an idea of what the 1.0 experience of Star Citizen is going to look like from these different points of view. We're not going to get that whole point of view, but we're going to get this much of it. And then we're going to get this much. And then we're going to get this much as we lead up to 1.0. Um, so last month, the mission design continued to work on a chain that comprises various mission types that scale in difficulty. Elsewhere, designs for new missions are currently being signed off, while content and technical requirements are underway for future hauling content. Future hauling content. So hold on. Bite of ice cream before we dive into this a little bit. So we're getting cargo missions. I'm already talking about future hauling content and how they're going to expand on that. And so I don't think this is so simple as, um, oh, oh, we, you know, you know, they, they talked about at Citizen Con some of the various types of hauling missions with um, fragile cargo, cargo that requires specific uh, parameters to be maintained, um, time-sensitive cargo, what have you. I think that some of this is going to be like that. I think part of it is when they say technical requirements is getting ready for that, but also getting ready for um, when cargo missions are contracts that are generated by quantum, because that is what hauling is. This is what haul, uh, quantum was designed for. Everybody fixated on the dynamic pricing because I thought it meant dynamic pricing in related to commodity trading. What it meant is more dynamic pricing in terms of the cost of fuel, the cost of repair, the cost of finished goods, your weapons, your ammo, um, your, your missiles, your components and such. It was never meant to be a, a focus on dynamic pricing for commodity trading because you can go back and you can watch the first quantum presentation. The whole thing is designed around generating contacts or contracts to move goods and, and, and cargo and commodities from one place to another to make the resource management system work 
for locations that are production nodes. This is what we're going to talk about next time. So keep that in mind. It is a colony sim gone uh, on steroids is what quantum is. Um, the development of Xeno Threat 1.2 continued with changes to gameplay and the implementation of freight elevators while Blockade Runner. So Xeno Threat and freight elevators. Um, you're going to have to unload your freight that you uh, re recover in Xeno Threat into a freight elevator at um, Jericho Station. While Blockade Runner received polish and the implementation of freight, uh, freight runners, same or freight elevators, same thing. And now we are on to narrative on the PU side, and uh, down here is on the PU side, and then we've got a whole bunch on the squadron side as well. But first, buy the ice cream, because ice cream is life. Mm, so good. Blueberry oatmeal crumble. Non-dairy, because dairy makes my tummy hurt. February saw a flurry of missions work uh, of mission work as narrative focused on the upcoming Alpha 323 patch. Alongside UI and hint text, many of the new gameplay features will have corresponding <coughs> Pardon me. Um, many of the new gameplay features will have corresponding missions and the team have been working closely with design to develop the narrative players will experience. For example, the new distribution centers feature a wide variety of missions, new and old. Additionally, uh, narrative work began on new pyro based missions to help expand the gameplay at its various locations. Uh, looking further forward, Progress continued on future story missions. These will be more involved than typical missions, featuring things like bespoke dialogue and custom logic. Mission givers. They are ramping up to get ready to start introducing more mission givers and, and um, story arcs and, and mission arcs from mission givers. That's what they're talking about here. Um. The hope is that these missions will serve to build out the story of the wider universe and work alongside the more traditional systemic missions. Yeah, so it's all going to be a, a sort of networked system. You will do these story missions as sort of a, a progression with a faction or a mission giver. And some of these missions will be story missions, but they'll also be, you know, you'll have these systemic missions as side missions attached to it, um, you know, in terms of this greater progression system. Uh, last month, the narrative design team continued to develop the tourist behaviors. Here we go. We were talking about tourist behaviors um, for um, Invictus Launch Week that will bring new life to Star Citizen's large in-world events. It has been an interesting balance how to make sure the NPC presence is felt while not being overly distracting from the event itself. Um, finally, new, uh, several new narrative posts were published, including the Whitley's Guide to the Valkyrie, which is really good reading. I reference this a lot in my, um, yeah, in I actually reference this quite a bit in the boarding actions video, ironically enough. Even though the Valkyrie is in a boarding ship, some of the lore in here is relevant um, to boarding. Um, and a fresh batch of Galactopedia articles. And I'm all caught up on lore equals gameplay. So if you haven't checked those out, I covered the um, January uh, and February Galactopedia updates over the last week or so. And they are up on my YouTube if you're interested in that sort of thing. So uh, let's see. Now we are moving on to the squadron side for narrative. Do, 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 the So here we go. Uh, the narrative team continued to close out Squadron 42's remaining text needs. Um, this included providing chatter for some of the background environments, creating Moby Glass content, writing content for... Pardon me, little cough. 
uh, writing content for cinematics, and continuing to create other opportunities for environmental storytelling to enrich the locations and provide a sense of history. Um, as mentioned in last month's report, the team continued to work with the gameplay and design teams to polish the Galactopedia experience, solidifying the approach for when and how articles unlock. The existing entries were also passed along to the localization team to start translating. Uh, without spoiling anything, the team kept working closely with an artist to create some ex exciting content. The team also developed some lore for another set of collectibles that were, will require art as well. No spoilers. Oh boy, more collectibles. More things to find in the environment and hoard. <laughs> uh, finally, the narrative, uh, finally, narrative continued to review the latest levels via playthrough and video to see if scenes are triggering as intended alongside polishing the overall narrative experience. We're getting close. That's This is part of why I think we're going to get a release date at CitizenCon, and it'll be six months out, give or take. Um, let's see. So moving on to R&D, which is all on the Star Citizen side. Uh, in February, the R&D team continued to work on the temporal render mode. Um Let's see. Uh, history filtering was switched to a custom bicubic filter to avoid diffusion and resampling blur due to a repeated uh, due to repeated history lookups. Care was also taken to eliminate potential ringing artifacts over, uh, during strong camera movements. The temporal filtering of transmittance was improved to avoid to avoid glowing thin silhouettes around objects in foregrounds with clouds and the sun behind them. Visual or various improvements were made to preserve history details for as long as possible. Slow movement, uh, no significant cloud, disocclusion, etc. And to quickly converge to a full resolution image in case history needs uh, to be rejected. So uh, a lot more um, cloud and atmosphere improvements uh, coming. This is part of the work that they showed off at CitizenCon to get ready to release those big improvements um, to the to the PU and let's see now we're on to tech art animation which is all shared so we'll read on the star citizen side uh, tech art animation last month the tech animation team uh, focused on refining head assets and cleaning up technical debt around their uh, implementation so uh, refining head assets this is um, for our uh, new character customizer, which was added to the release view for 3.23. This comes as a precursor to polishing head assets and refining eye alignments in the editor to ensure characters look as good as possible. Uh, further to this, a large contingent of the department is working on assets set up for lockers. This is important. This is the next step of inventory um, and localization of the inventory rather than just having Sorry, ice cream. Um, so you will be, think about, as an example, when you come out of your hangar, and they might even put them in the hangar, but when you come out of your hangar and you go into the spaceport and you're about to go through customs and there's all those lockers there and there's lockers in the space station as well, you'll be able to, the, the idea is for you to be able to store things there um, in order to part, you know, partly to comply with like security regulations and such, but also to be able to, you know, just store things there for later. But this is a, um, uh, a part of, oh, hell, let's just open it up. I'll pull up the, the thing on the release view for it or the, the progress tracker. So roadmap, or progress tracker, deliverables, lockers. So player interaction experience here one, lockers in inventory. Um, so I don't think we're going to be getting like f being able to visualize items within the locker. He instead will use those inventory views. Um, but you're, you, you'll be able to, uh, the, this whole, uh, Experience is all about being able to um, 
it's coupled with the customization for your your Habs and your ship and your um, hangar, as well as being able to store things in um, inventory lockers throughout the verse. Um, in order to further subdivide your inventory instead of having, you know, we used to have the global inventory and now we have the location-based inventory and you're going to further subdivide the inventory based off of physical locations um, within those greater locations. You'll have lockers in your hab. You'll have, you know, you, you, you'll have a, a hab inventory that's subdivided into individual lockers. You'll have a hangar inventory that uh, has lockers. You'll have a, an inventory you know, within the spaceport, you know, via your lockers. And so you, it won't be, you're going to have to physically go up to the locker and open it to interact with it. But these lockers will also be aboard ships. If you look at the invent the interior of your ships, you see all these doors and panels and everything for storing things. And some of them work, some of them don't. But this is going to be part of that, is being able to use those things. And so you won't have access to an entire ship inventory just by sitting on the cargo deck in the middle of the the, the Valkyrie, you're going to have to go up to, you know, this locker in the Valkyrie in order to, you know, this one has a whole bunch of medical supplies stored in it. And this one has food and beverages and, you know, and so on. So, um, something to think about, this is getting ready to set us up for what the experience is really meant to be. Um, these will be placed throughout the verse and allow players and NPCs to change their apparel to something more appropriate to their current priorities. So that way you can, you know, if, you're, if your home is set at Orison and you arrive in your, your ship and you, you store it there at the spaceport, when you get out of your ship, you're in your spacesuit and everything, and you want to go to the bar or you want to go meet a mission giver or something like that, you can quickly change out of your spacesuit uh, or, or your armor and what have you into civilian clothes rather than, you know, you're, you're you know, having to have them in your spaceport inventory and such. Uh, but a, a much more realistic interaction experience. This sounds simple, but in practice, we have to support a wide array of assets that can be stowed and recovered from these vessels. It can take quite some time to ensure everything is set up correctly. The team also kicked off initiatives to ensure the health of the build remains stable and triage technical debt built up over the course of the project. So this is a good thing. If they are prioritizing technical debt even more so than before, it means that they are trying to clear up that technical debt or it suggests that they're trying to clear up some of that technical debt ahead of major releases um, in order to have a much more clean and stable experience. Leading up to 4.0, 1.0, anyone? When we have a lot more people coming into the game. So uh, now we have UI and then lastly VFX. So UI... Uh, is only on the squadron side. The UI team worked closely with the environment and cinematics teams last month, creating several pieces of movie-style UI that appear during cutscenes. They also created screens around the game, around the game levels to help with storytelling and atmosphere. Design work was done to help improve EVA and AR markers too. Um, and now for VFX on the squadron side, last month, as well as the usual art, cinematics, and design support, the VFX team focused on polishing and optimizing an effects-intensive in-game scenario. As part of this, the artists began looking at areas where they can create bespoke explosion texture sequences. Well, okay, so a lot of big bada-boom explosions. Mm, that sounds foreboding. Uh, to create a more cinematic, high-fidelity experience for the player. Uh, and VFX on the Star Citizen side... Last month, the VFX team continued working on several upcoming locations, including freight elevators and distribution centers. Several, and including. Uh, they also investigated in, um, so upcoming locations. So the, that is not the extent of the list, uh, which is freight elevators and distribution centers. There's, but wait, there's more. They also investigated an issue with planetary ground storms where fog was coming in too thick when light winds arrive. Although it's difficult to balance dynamic effects such as this, it will be easier for players to see where they are going if a storm is relatively mild. That's a good thing because it, A, if the wind is light, or it, it, you shouldn't have thick fog um, settling where, where wind is light. But this is also a performance issue. If you have 
thick fog along with the wind, you have a lot of particle effects going on uh, that create that, and it affects your performance um, uh, uh, on your client. And so um, this will help make it so that way these um, light winds and and you know small small storms don't just you know really tank your FPS on Hurston or uh, Microtech and such. And that is it for the um, combined Star Citizen and Squadron 42 monthly reports. So I'm going to switch screens. And we're going to... Oh, we're not going to turn off that. We want to turn off this guy. Because Naz is not with us right now. So uh, that is it for the podcast tonight. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me this evening. Really appreciate the support. Lots more followers. Um coming in and hanging out with us uh, again just to reiterate uh, Mustang 6 who is the artist that I have partnered with on the concept art for my side project um, uh, Give Them Hope uh, he will be streaming uh, this Saturday morning at 9am or 9 a.m. Eastern um, working on the concept art uh, and his process and everything for the um, Alliance Marine ship um, um NASA. So if you're interested in that, go check it out. Uh, you'll be able to see some of the concept art that we've been working on. And he's going to uh, use the prompts that we've been going over with to create some sketches and, and talk about his process. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I hope I will be able to watch live. It will just uh, depend on um, the uh, honeydew list <laughs> and uh, yeah, how much dad mode I have to do. Um, but uh, go so, uh, go show them uh, show them some support and, and check it out. Um, let us know what you think. We'd really like your feedback as we go through this process. Um, but I, I'm really excited about it. Um, the second episode of uh, Give Them Hope, uh, you know, is term, you know where I'm world building the universe for the game and talking about how that universe connects with the gameplay mechanics. Um, it will be up on my YouTube tomorrow um, at. It's 2 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, 2 p.m. Eastern, 12 Mountain Time. Um, so go ahead and check that out. Um, and if you have feedback, if you have questions about the universe for after watching these episodes, hop in my Discord, come over to the game dev section and let me know if you think that there, if you have suggestions, things that I could flesh out better. Um, obviously, it's a work in pro progress. And so a lot of it is just me speaking from my head on uh, uh, from bullet points as references and these things will be fleshed out in a, a, a narrative way um, but the link to um, the my, my document that I've got going um, is also in my discord in the game dev section it's pinned so check it out tell me tell me what you think um, if I've made a typo let me know you know by all means I, I I appreciate the support, but uh, I appreciate any feedback, constructive feedback you can offer myself in Mustang 6. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and find someone to raid, and that way we can send someone else some love. And I appreciate all you guys uh, being a part of the show this evening. And this will be up on my YouTube. Let's see, tomorrow is Tuesday, so this should be up on Thursday um, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. So let's uh, see who we can raid. Uh, anyone that I'm following up? Ooh, Papa Juggernaut. We raided Papa Juggernaut the other night. Um, and, oh, where'd it go? Oh, are they not? There we go. Papa Juggernaut is doing a charity stream. Um, it says helping hospitalized kids. So I'm going to take and uh, make an executive decision and we're going to um, raid Papa Juggernaut uh, to help him with his charity stream um, and because uh, and, we're all about to charity here so Papa Juggernaut all right lots of love for Papa Juggernaut this week all about supporting charity endeavors, and especially when we're talking about helping kids. All right, rating in three, two, one, go.